start the recording. Thank you for catching that, Daniel. I appreciate that. Excellent. So again, there is no difference between chromatin and chromosomes uh, other than their shape. Uh, here we see that loose bowl of spaghetti. That is the chromatin. As we look at it up close, we see it is DNA wrapped around proteins, uh, like the, those histones and other types of proteins that are involved in this. And we see our double helix of the DNA that we talked about last time. However, when the cell starts to divide, it is going to bundle up into a tightly packed chromosome. So those DNA and proteins tightly pack into a chromosome. Now, as I mentioned, these chromosomes only form when the cell is getting ready to divide, or more specifically, the nucleus. All right, so this occurs during mitosis. However, we know something about our DNA uh, that goes, has to occur before mitosis. Remember, if one cell is gonna divide to become two cells, we need two copies of the genetic material. And remind me again, when do we make that second copy of the DNA? S phase. S phase, right, excellent. S phase of interphase. So notice when our chromatin condenses down into chromosomes, when that occurs, it is already replicated. So when we form a chromosome, notice over here we see a chromosome is just a single stick-like structure, but that chromosome has already been replicated. The DNA has already been replicated. And so as such, and I'll cheat and use a little solid line, what we are going to have, what one chromosome actually is, is two identical strands of DNA folded up into uh, tightly packed structures. So what we have here, let me use my drawing tool here. This whole thing right here is what we would consider one chromosome. However, it is comprised of two identical copies of DNA. And so we give those names as well. They are sister chromatids. So two sister chromatids form one chromosome. Now we need to keep track of these sister chromatids. So these sister chromatids need to be held together. They are held together by a special protein. And this special protein that anchors the two of them together is known as a centromere. These sister chromatids also, and I'm gonna to have to cheat here for a minute, take my... Professor? Yes. Did you say the sister chromatin form uh, DNA together? Yes, so the sister chromatids are the chromatin that has been folded up and tightly packed into a compact structure. Okay, thank you. Yep. So that is our centromere right here. And we need to be able to move these sister chromatids around inside of the cell. And so there is also going to be additional proteins that are located out here on the sides of our uh, chromosomes. And these additional proteins are called kinetochores. So let's go through it again, because that's a lot of confusing vocabulary. Our loose DNA in proteins is chromatin. Chromatin condenses down to form chromosomes, tightly packing and bundled together. However, in that chromosome, the genetic material has already been replicated. 
because our DNA was replicated way back in the S phase of interphase. So we have two copies of identical genetic material known as two sister chromatids. We need to keep track of those two sister chromatids, so they are held together by a centromere. So one chromosome is two sister chromatids held together by one centromere. And if you think about it, that's what we commonly think of when we think of a chromosome. When you look at a chromosome and you see it under a microscope, it looks kind of like an X. Everybody draws them and kind of shows them as Xs. But in reality, it's not really an X. It's really more of an H. You have one sister chromatid and a second sister chromatid that is held together by that central mirror. So that's why they draw it as X's. It kind of looks like an X, but technically it's actually more of an H shape. But so yeah, whenever you look at chromosomes, you typically see them as X's, and that's because we have those two identical copies of genetic material that are held together by a protein in the center. And we need to move this chromosome around inside of the cell. So to do that, we have additional proteins on the lateral aspects of it known as kinetochores. So there you go, lots of vocabulary. Chromatin, chromosome, chromatid, centromere, kinetochores. A lot of vocabulary. All right, and let's do it again. Our chromatin is replicated DNA. So we get two copies, those sister chromatids. And here, if you don't like uh, the drawing that I did, here we see those two identical sister chromatids here, held together at the center by a centromere. And notice as you see these little red proteins are those kinetochores. That is where our microtubules are going to connect to them to move them around. Because if you remember, we said our centri uh, centrioles are the microtubule organizing structures, and it is those microtubules that are going to move our chromosomes around inside the cell. All right, fun with vocabulary. Questions on that? All right, excellent. Then our goal now is to talk about the process of mitosis and cytokinesis. Again, what collectively is known as the mitotic phase. So we are gonna talk about the mitotic phase there and they're overlapping. And here this illustration does a nicer job of kind of showing how the two processes overlap. Here in light yellow is mitosis. Here in dark yellow is cytokinesis. And again, cytokinesis starts about halfway through anaphase and continues past telophase. So again, they're overlapping uh, in, somewhat in these processes and steps. All right. Now, as I often like to do when we talk about elaborate physiological processes, I like to go over it twice. The first time, I like to do it on the board uh, using my writing, doing the drawing, doing all those types of things and talking about it. For that one, I strongly encourage you to just put your pens and your pencils down to just watch, to just look and just listen. Then we'll go through the entire process again with all the pretty pictures and all the pretty words of the textbook. And there you can write to your heart's content. But for this first part, I strongly encourage you just to sit back and watch and listen uh, to make sure that this makes sense. All right, I think it's an easy way because if you're, if you're furiously trying to write down what I'm saying, you're not comprehending what I'm saying and you're not putting any time and thought into it. So that doesn't help you to learn it. So for this first time, just sit back, watch, relax, try not to fall asleep, and we will go through this process together. All right, so our goal, and let's remind ourselves of what our goal is here. Our goal, is to divide one cell into two identical cells. And by identical, I mean to each other and to the original. All right, that is uh, the goal of this process. And we can cheat by drawing that here. So here is, no, don't want pink, let's go black. There is cell one, and we want this cell one to divide to form two cells. 
that are identical to each other. And of course, by identical, we mean that we want them to have, both have Golgi apparatus, both have rough endoplasmic reticulum and all those types of things. But the part that is most important is its nucleus. So let's change the color of the nucleus. Here we'll have the nucleus in here on this one, and this one here, and this one here. Excellent. All right. Now, if this was a human cell, how many chromosomes would be inside of this particular cell? 46. 46, right. 23 pairs. Now, again, as amazing as my drawing skills are, I can't fit 46 things in there and make it look pretty. So for simplicity's sake, what I'm going to do is give these four chromosomes. But if it works for four chromosomes, it will work for 46. Now, let's start with a red one. And again, remember, in this cell, when it's in interphase, when it's in G0, remember our chromosome isn't really a chromosome, it's just a loose strand of chromatin. So we have that loose strand of chromatid there, one of them's red, and then let's give it a green one. There's a green one in here, and a green one in here, and a green one in here, and then we'll go a blue one, a blue one in here, and a blue one over here, and a blue one over here. And then, uh, what are we left with? Let's go yellow. A yellow one in here, and a yellow one in here, and the yellow one in there. There you go. We have all of our genetic material in that loose chromatin. All right? So this is our starting point. This would be our first cell in interphase. And I'm going to need that to be a lot smaller for this to fit in. If I make it that small, can you guys still read that okay? Let me ask the question this way. Is there anybody who cannot read that? Yes, you cannot read it or, okay, yes. Yes, the first question, no, the second one. Okay, excellent. All right, perfect. So that's it. So here we have a cell in interphase and then we have two cells in interphase. All right, so let's talk first about mitosis. Mitosis, remind me again, what is mitosis the process of? It's the nucleus division. Excellent. Division of the nucleus. And how many stages does it have again? Four. Four and a half. Excellent. And what were those four stages again? The chemistry. Phase, prophase, anaphase, metaphase, and. Excellent. Prophase, go ahead, finish it off. Prophase. Metaphase. IP met. Oh, I like that for you to throw interphase in there. Be careful, though. I remember interphase is not a part of mitosis, so you do have to be careful with that. I do like that. Uh, okay, excellent. So prophase, metaphase, anaphase. Oops, wrong button. Metaphase, put anaphase here, anaphase, and telophase. Excellent. Those are our four stages, although as we'll learn, it's a little bit more tricky than that. Let's talk about what happens in each of these stages, and let's start first with prophase. No. So here is our cell in prophase. Now, one more thing. What did we say was the trigger that starts mitosis? ends interphase and begins the mitotic phase. Anybody what, remember what we said the trigger was? The centrioles? The there centrioles. you go. The trigger to start mitosis is the completion of the replication of our second centrosome. Excellent. So when that second centrosome is completed, 
then what happens is we start prophase. So let's go ahead and put our nucleus in here. Well, like I said, technically it should be brown. Let's do that. And now in purple, we will draw our two centrosomes. We now have two centrosomes, which we can see by the two representations of the two perpendicular tubular structures that are the centrioles. And this is the start of prophase. In prophase, we are going to start three important processes. We're gonna start three important processes. The first thing that is going to happen is the centrosomes, or let's go more specific, the centrioles start to migrate to the poles of the cell. And they start to make spindles. So what happens is, One of these starts to migrate. Oh, that's way too big. One of these starts to migrate to one side of the cell. The other starts to migrate to the other side of the cell. And at the same time that is occurring, as we know, they're going to start to organize their microtubules starting to form that star shape aster we were talking about uh, previously when we talked about these. So we're going to get these star-shaped asters that are going to start to form as they start to form their spindles, or what we could also just simply refer to as the microtubules, organizing them around them. So that is thing one that starts to happen during prophase. The second thing that starts to happen is our loose chromatin starts to coil up, condense, into chromosomes. So they start to get more tightly packed in there. Because again, if we've got that bowl of soup and we a bowl of spaghetti and we're trying to move it around, we need to start to condense these things down. So they're slowly going to start to condense down, right, into their more easily tightly packed structures. Blue, uh, whoops, that's all right. Our red, green, our yellow. Which brings us to the third thing that we need to have happen. The third thing that we need to have happen is if we're gonna be able to move these around inside the cell, we gotta get rid of that nuclear envelope. So we're gonna break down the nuclear envelope. So that nuclear envelope is gonna to start to break down as well. Move this over here, move this over here for me. All right, so we can cheat and do it this way. Think, 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 think. We start to get that. So there you go. In prophase, these three things start to happen. In fact, there's a whole lot of stuff that happens in prophase. And because there's a whole lot of stuff that happens in prophase, what they often will do is they will refer to prophase as being either late prophase or early prophase. So really what we're talking about, the start of all these processes is what I refer to as early prophase. Remember, I've kind of not so subtly said that there are four and a half stages in mitosis because often they will talk about early prophase and then they will talk about late prophase. And because as we know, anatomists hate you. And secondly, they need to sell more books 
The other thing that some uh, anatomists have started to do is instead of saying that there are four stages, they've said, you know, prophase, so much is happening. Let's go ahead and divide it into two stages. And what they will do in that case is they will just call early prophase, prophase, and they will give a fancy name to this stage in between prophase and metaphase. And because anatomists aren't very creative, the amazing term, the amazing name they came up for the phase between prophase and metaphase is prometaphase. Now, when you describe this on your exam, you may use either of those two phrases. You may use and describe early prophase and late prophase, or you may talk about prophase and prometaphase. I don't care how you want to describe it. Just make sure you distinguish these two periods of time. All right. Now, we know that in early prophase, these three important processes start. So not surprisingly, in late prophase, we have completed these three phases. So there's that. Uh, hold on. Undo that. Undo that. Here's my cell. By late prophase, we have completed all three processes. What that means is that our centrioles have reached the poles opposite sides of the cells from each other. So that one there and that one there, this one there and this one there. Our nuclear envelope has completely broken down and our four chromosomes have formed. So there's my red one and here's my blue one and here's my green one and here's my yellow one. So the nuclear envelope's gone, my chromosomes have formed, my centrioles have reached the poles. But there's one other thing that is happening. So we complete all three processes, plus one other important thing happens during this period of time. Those spindles attach to each other and to the kinetochores. of the chromosomes. So remember, we have those spindle fibers that are being formed coming off of our uh, centrioles. In some cases, what'll happen is one spindle from one side will actually attach to the other spindle of the other side this helps to push and elongate the shell, the cell to move it across from each other, helping to elongate it to make it easier to divide in half. But the other thing that will happen is that these spindles, these microtubules, will actually connect to the kinetochores of our chromosomes, one from one side and one from the other. So this one will attach here, and this one will attach here. This one will attach here, this one will attach here, this one will attach here, and this one will attach there. And let's go putting one more together on the opposite side just so we can remember that they attach to each other as well. All right, and that is late prophase or prometaphase. Questions on that? All right, let's talk about metaphase then. Ah. In metaphase, what's going to happen is we are going to use those spindles to dynamically move our chromosomes. So we are either going to break down 
or add proteins to the spindles to dynamically change their shape. Or really change their length more specifically. And the goal of this is to line all the chromosomes up on the equator of the cell. Oops, don't need that. Uh, it, on the equator of the cell. Now, of course, if like just the Earth has a North Pole and a South Pole and it has an equator, but a cell, of course, is going to have a fancy name for it. And that fancy name is the metaphase plate. So what is going to happen here is that our spindles, and so let me start by drawing our centrioles again. One there, one there. One there, one there. And this time I'm only gonna draw the spindle fibers that connect to the chromosomes. So if you look, for instance, at this red chromosome, it's pretty close to the midline of where we need it to be. So what's gonna happen is maybe this spindle has to grow a little bit and this spindle has to grow, you know, break down a little bit. But what it's able to do is it is able to line up that chromosome right here on the midline, and that's huge and not gonna help me. So I'll put it here and here, and then I can cheat and connect my spindle there and my spindle there. Excellent, and it's been able to line it up. Notice the yellow one, my spindle has to, down here has to grow a lot further to move it up, and this one has to break it down a lot. But in this fashion, what we are going to be able to do is we are gonna be able to move all of the chromosomes by changing the shape, changing the size of these uh, spindle fibers to line them all up along the midline, along that metaphase plate at the center of our cell. And again, I'll just draw the spindles that connect to the kinetochores now. There we go. And so notice everything lines up on the metaphase plate, and that is what occurs in metaphase. All right. Questions on that? All right, excellent. Now, once we have everything lined up on the metaphase plate, what is gonna happen now is that the centromere, that one protein that is holding the sister chromatids together is going to inactivate. So let me write this out first. Our centromere inactivates. And when it inactivates, oops, don't need that all to be capitals. And when it inactivates, now the sister chromatids are not held together anymore. And when they're not held together anymore, they're technically not sister chromatids anymore. So our sister chromatids are not connected. And when they're not connected, technically, now they're referred to, so we'll say it this way, become daughter chromosomes. And once they're not connected, once we have those daughter chromosomes, what happens are those spindle fibers rapidly pull the daughter chromosomes to the opposite poles. Of the cell. So what happens and let's take a look first at our red chromosome to see how this is going to work. 
when it inactivates, I don't want that one, uh, that centromere inactivates, we now have those daughter chromosomes, and those daughter chromosomes are going to be rapidly pulled to the opposite sides. As they're being rapidly pulled to the opposite sides, because they're being pulled from the middle, there's a little bit of drag. And so our daughter chromosomes typically take on a very distinct V-shaped pattern. Because as those spindle fibers are pulling it towards the pole, they're yanking on it from the center, and we go from these very distinct X-shaped structures to these very distinct V-shaped structures. So our yellow, oops, no, hold on. I don't want to do that. Our yellow daughter chromosomes are pulled to opposite sides. Our blue daughter chromosomes are pulled to opposite sides. And our green daughter chromosomes are pulled towards the opposite poles. So again, we have those spindle fibers rapidly breaking down, rapidly pulling the now daughter chromosomes that have been separated from each other towards the poles. So metaphase is when we line up the chromosomes, we then split the chromosomes, and now the daughter chromosomes are pulled to the opposite sides during anaphase. All right, questions on that? All right, excellent. That brings us to telophase. In telophase, in many ways, telophase is kind of prophase in reverse. What's happened now is that uh, as long as the chromosomes are moving, we are still in anaphase. Once the chromosomes stop moving, then we are in telophase. And so in telophase, a couple things need to occur. Our chromosomes have stopped moving because they've reached the pole. All right. At which point those uh, tightly packed chromosomes are going to start to unwind. And if they start to unwind, our chromosomes start to become chromatin again. Oh, this, is an this is an important point I haven't made, but we'll make it in a second. Now, if we're going to have loose chromatin, we need to contain it. So we are going to need to reform nuclear envelopes. However, where we had one nuclear envelope before, how many nuclear envelopes are we going to need here? Two. Two, absolutely. So really, it's not so much that we're reforming a nuclear envelope, but instead, really what we're doing is forming two nuclear envelopes that will form two complete nuclei as a result of that. And here's the other point I wanted to emphasize. Way back here, remember as we talked about, let's go back to our cell in interface. With our cell in interface, what color haven't I used yet? I haven't used this dark, I haven't used pink. Let's go with pink. Um, remember, here inside of our nucleus, with that loose chromatin, we can read a portion of this chromatin to make proteins. And we tightly pack this bundle of proteins and enzymes and other things around that to make that protein. And what did we call that structure? that was formed, that dense spot that's so dense with proteins we can actually see it under a light microscope. What did we call that again? Nucleolus. Nucleolus, excellent. You're absolutely correct, excellent. So if you think about it, 
when way back here in protein, when our centri uh, when pardon me, when our loose chromatin is coiling up into chromosomes, if you think about it, during this time, uh, if we pack up all of our books into a uh, suitcase, we can't read those books anymore. We can't make proteins anymore, right? Dividing the cell requires a tremendous amount of energy, so we don't want to be making proteins while we're doing it anyway. So during early prophase, our nucleoli go away. But if here our two, uh, our loose chromatin, I mean, our, pardon me, our tightly packed chromosomes are loosening up to become chromatin, then notice once again, we can actually get the formation of nucleoli. Uh, so for nucleoli can start to form in this. So what happens is, and let's go ahead and draw this in brown, we start to get a new nuclear envelope that is forming over here on this side. We get a new nuclear envelope that is forming here on this side. And inside of it, we are getting our loose chromatin. And at this point, nucleoli can start to form in here as these nuclei start to be able to make new proteins. And of course, at the end of this process, we have a complete nuclear envelope and a second complete nuclear envelope. We have two complete nuclei both with identical information in them, and mitosis is complete. However, is cell division complete? Yes, this is all a continuous process. It does not stop. All right, excellent, no. We have completed mitosis, but we have not completed cell division. Because remember, the other part of cell division is cytokinesis. Cytokinesis, remember, is the physical division of the cell or the division of the cytoplasm. This process begins in late anaphase. So cytokinesis begins oops, in late anaphase. The advantage of this is that in late anaphase, the chromosomes aren't near the middle of the cell anymore. Remember, we had that metaphase plate. Well, it turns out around the cell in the metaphase plate, well, let's say it at, I like that better. We have a ring of actin. Remember actin we mentioned was one of our cytoskeletal structures and it allowed for dynamic changes in the shape of the cell. And this actin ring pretty much works like a belt, right? Back in ancient times, we all used to wear pants, right? Of course, none of us wear pants anymore because we're all stuck at home, but in ancient times, we used to wear pants. And when you would put on pants, one of the things you would put on is a belt. And when you put that belt on, what you would do is put the end of the belt through the loop, and then you would cinch it. And as you cinched it, the inside part of it of the loop got smaller. And that's exactly what this actin ring does. There is this ring of actin. What is this gonna do? Oh, I like that. There is this ring of actin that wraps around the center of the metaphase plate. And as it wraps around the center of the metaphase plate, what happens is it starts to squeeze. And as it starts to squeeze, and I'll cheat, and do this. 
as that actin ring starts to cinch around it, what ends up happening is it starts to pucker the edges of the cell. So we start to get this indentation that forms. And let's cheat and see if I can erase this just to make it look a little better. This indentation that forms because of the actin ring is what is known as the cleavage furrow. that is going to form. Now, I'm not suggesting anybody should do this to themselves, but if you put a belt on and squeeze it, squeeze it, squeeze it, squeeze it, squeeze it, squeeze it enough, then eventually you could pinch it in half. And that is exactly what happens here with our cell. That actin ring continues to squeeze more and more and more and more and more until essentially what it has done is the two ends of the ring meet in the middle and it divides the cell in half. Now our cytoplasm has been divided in half, our nucleus has been divided in half, and with cytokinesis and mitosis together, we get two identical cells that are identical to each other and identical to the original. Questions on that? Stunned silence. Excellent. What I love to hear sir, after I've can you, Sir, yeah. can you can you can you explain or can you go back to the uh, cleavage furrow? Yes. As you pinch the cell and that indentation forms, that indentation that forms on the edge of the cell is what is known as the cleavage furrow. And that cleavage furrow becomes more and more and more enhanced until ultimately the single cell is pinched into two cells. All right. And that is cellular division, mitosis and cytokinesis. I've done a truly amazing job of drawing this on the board, but let's take a look at it with this pretty pictures from your textbook. See if we can make some sense out of it. Again, mitosis has four and a half stages, depending on how you, four or five, I guess, really. And again, if you think about it, if it's four phases, which is again, perfectly acceptable, you're perfectly welcome to say four stages. Then as we talked about those four stages are prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. However, if you do think of it as five stages, prophase, prometaphase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase, then you really have what you have in the bathroom, a PP mat, right? So you can either have a P mat or a PP mat, whatever makes you happy. You may use either way to describe it, early prophase and late prophase, or prophase and prometaphase. I'm fine with either of those descriptions. But we can't forget about cytokinesis. All right. And again, it forms that cleavage furrow we talked about. You are responsible for identifying. Uh, you are responsible for identifying um, these stages in plants. So one of the things that I do want to point out real quickly is plants, as we know, are wonky things. Uh, plants have cell walls. And so when the cell divides, it doesn't pinch itself in half the same way. What actually happens in a plant cell, cytokinesis in a plant cell, it actually starts to make some of the fibers uh, that form the cell wall and put them in vesicles, and it starts to line the vesicles up in the center of the cell, forming a structure that is called a cell plate. Then it adds more and more fibers to that cell plate and the cell plate gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger until the cell divides into two. So for the most part, that's the only thing that's really different in this. Uh, animal cells get squeezed and plant cells form that plate. And so when we're looking at a telophase in plants, you'll see that again, it has a roughly formed nucleus here and it might have, um, Let's cheat. 
uh, you know, a partial, a partial line, dark line kind of forming in the center like that. So that's kind of how you would recognize a telophase in plants. That's really the only thing that's going to be different between plants and animals. Otherwise, uh, it's pretty simple and straightforward. All right, clear that. So here we see a couple things. We see our pretty picture from your textbook in illustration. Notice we have our loose chromatin in here. The nucleolus is here because we're reading some of the proteins. Our nuclear envelope is intact. But we've had that trigger event occur. And that trigger event that occurs is we have two centrosomes. We see the two sets of centrioles have formed. They're starting to form their asters around them. And that is our trigger to start mitosis. Mitosis begins with prophase. In prophase, notice, and wait, let's go back. I like this one other thing. Oops, I want to show you here. Notice here we have this. Um, this is actually a high resolution light microscopy, but it's been colorized so that they've colored like the components. So for instance, we can see some of the spindles that are forming and other components out of skeletal structures. But notice here, this blue structure is the nucleus. Notice you can see the distinct border because the nuclear envelope is intact. But remember that chromatin is so tiny that you just see it as this loose cloud of material. Notice, in early prophase, the nuclear envelope is still intact. We can still see that distinct border to the nucleus. But notice now we can actually start to see the strands of DNA as they're starting to condense down into chromosomes. Notice they're not nice X-shaped structures yet because this is early prophase. Notice we can clearly see our two spindles as they're starting to move away from each other, forming those spindle fibers, right? Those asters as they are moving towards the poles of the cell. And our illustration doesn't show it, but we know the third thing that's gonna be happening is our nuclear envelope is gonna to start to break down. I actually, Maxim, you don't have to take a picture of it. I've actually taken a copy of it. And if you actually look in the modules, there's a place where I can put images from the lecture. I will be posting that picture there. So you don't have to take a picture of it. I will post that picture of my drawing of mitosis onto the, onto the, uh, onto the uh, um, website in the modules. So I'll put that there. All right. So again, nucleoli disappear. Our centrosomes start to migrate. Our nuclear envelope starts to break down. And our chromatin starts to condense down into chromosomes. All of these events start in early prophase. And they all finish by late prophase. Again, notice the light microscopy. The spindles are on opposite sides. Our DNA is no longer contained within a nuclear envelope. It's kind of spread all over the place. And we can clearly see distinct chromosomes. So our chromosomes are formed and spread out throughout the cell. Our nuclear envelope has been broken down. And our two centri uh, centrioles have reached the opposite poles from each other and form these elaborate spindle fibers. They're microtubules, but they're spindle fibers. You may call them either. Notice those microtubules can connect to each other to help to stabilize the cell and stretch the cell out. But the other important thing that these microtubules do is they attach to the kinetochore. And by attaching to the kinetochore, it's gonna allow us to move these chromosomes around inside of the cell. So our nuclear envelope disappears, our centrosomes have reached the poles, our microtubule spindles are formed, and they are attaching to the chromosomes. Right. So you can kind of see why they would have wanted to divide this prophase into two stages. If you look at, and again, the illustrations make it obvious, but even in the light microscopy, you can see 
there's a big difference between what the cell looks like in early prophase and what the cell looks like in late prophase. So you can kind of see why some uh, anatomists or some physiologists, uh, microbiologists or whatever, uh, would want to identify these as two different stages because they look dramatically different during these stages. So again, if you want to say five stages and do that, there, and there, you can see pretty dramatically different from each other. And remember also, these pictures are straight from your textbook. So all these pictures are straight from your textbook as well. So remember you have that. All right, excellent. And again, those spindle fibers attached to the kinetochores. Once they attach to kinetochores, we start metaphase. Metaphase is where we move those spindle fibers. We either grow them or break them down to line up all the chromosomes on that equator. Of course, we're not gonna use the term equator. Instead, we're gonna use the fancy term, metaphase plate. So our microtubules dynamically change their length, some getting longer, some getting shorter, so that they can align all of the chromosomes independently along the metaphase plate. All right, questions on that? Once they line up, then that centromere, the protein that is holding the sister chromatids together, inactivates. And as soon as it inactivates, we now, our sister chromatids, have now become daughter chromosomes. And those daughter chromosomes get pulled to the poles. Right, so again, notice this one has so much chromosome, chromosomes in them, it's hard to see the V-shape. But what you can clearly see is that there is, let's not use blue because it has blue on it, use white. There is space that is forming in between them. They are separating from each other. They are being pulled apart. They're being pulled to opposite sides, giving them that very distinct V-shape as they're getting yanked to the two sides. Anaphase is typically the shortest of all of the mitotic phases. It's just that dynamic movement. And once they reach the poles, then telophase occurs. Notice we start to see a loose cloud of chromatin again. We're no longer able to see the individual strands that are tightly packed. They're starting to be condensed down into a nucleus. The nuclear envelope is starting to reform. And notice as we're loosening up the chromatin, now a nucleoli can start to reform. We can start making proteins again. So our nuclear envelope reforms, and really again, nuclear membranes, plural. Remember, we're forming two new nuclear envelopes with this. Where we had one nucleus before, we now have two nuclei. Our chromosomes uncoil into loose chromatin, forming that loose cl uh, cloud again. And our nucleoli start to reappear as we make proteins. That, of course, is the end of mitosis but it is not the end of the mitotic phase or again, cellular division. Because notice we also have cytokinesis. We now have two complete nuclei, but with cytokinesis, we need that actin ring along the metaphase plate that is gonna squeeze the cell, pinching the cell, forming that cleavage furrow until ultimately it squeezes and pinches it in two. And we end up with two identical cells. We've looked at all the individual stages. Yeah. And so here's one of the, the, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, one of the things you have mentioned about the uh, difference between the um, animal uh, cells and also plant cells and the plant cells you said like with, as uh, they have the uh, cell wall. Uh, are so instead of squeezing so the 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 furrow or the beta phase become bigger and bigger 
and divide the cell into two half, right? Yes, so what happens, yes, in plant cells is that a, um, a metaphase, uh, pardon me, a, a cell plate form, start of the cell wall, a little bit of cell wall will form in the middle in between them, and then it expands out to divide the cell in half. And we can actually take a look at that. All right. And so again, remember the end goal of this process is two identical cells, identical to each other, but also identical to the original one as well. And just that simply, we have described the process of mitosis. All right, questions on that? Um, doing a test. Yes. Are you going to ask her to like describe it, like the process of mitosis? Yes, absolutely. So what that so so yes. So if you think about this, obviously we spent a whole hour talking about this. So there are, if you think about it, really two ways that I could test you on it. And if you think about it, both ways are definitely going to be a part of the exam. Is when there are processes like this. Um, are you expected to be able to describe these processes? Is it possible that you may have to describe the process of mitosis or explain what happens in anaphase or explain what happens in prophase or yeah. something like that? Yes, absolutely. But I also can so show you cells, either models of cells, illustration of cells, or actual histology slides of cells, both plant and animal, and I can ask you to identify the stage in the cell cycle or the stage of the cell division, and you need to be able to recognize them that way. So this is material that I guarantee is gonna be both on the lab and the lecture exams. Okay, thank you. Yep. Any other questions? All right, excellent. Let's go ahead and take our first break. I show it as being 910. So let's come back at 925. And at 925, we will restart. Before we switch to lecture mode, uh, what I am going to do is we'll take a look at some histology. Uh, and then, uh, like I said, I will start the recording at that point as well. All right. Any questions? I thought this was, oh, you mean the previous slide. I'm sorry, this, I was gonna say, this is the last slide. <laughs> All right, yeah, hold on, let me go back. All right, there you go. All right, no worries. And I'm sorry, I, I apologize. I saw you sit, wrote last slide, but I was confused because I thought you wanted me to leave that last slide up. I was confused by that. So I, I apologize. All right, excellent. Any other questions? All right, I will see you guys in 15 minutes then.
All righty. <clears throat> now is when I said we'd get started, right? I wrote it down and then I forgot to write it down myself. Are we on? Are we ready? Has it been 15 minutes? Anyone? Bueller? I think it was 910. Laura, you're staring at me. Yes. Is now when we start? Yes. Okay. Perfect. Excellent. Yes. Okay. Excellent. All right. Two quick things before we get started. First, uh, uh, I'm, again, I'm sorry, I apologize. I've been dealing with a ton of emails. Uh, someone emailed me um, earlier about having problems getting the access to the uh, master a &P because they had already used their code. If that student can email me again, uh, I have I finally got a, my rep finally got a hold of me and I can help you resolve that issue. So if you can send me another email, I can get that resolved for you so that you can get access to the materials while you're waiting for your other resources to come in. Uh, also, as I mentioned, again, your study area access looks different from mine because, again, that's my student view. But remember, here is where you get to the Physio X. This is also where you'll get to your practice anatomy lab. There's study chapter quizzes and other materials uh, that can help you to practice. During the break, I was peeking around at some of the resources that I've already made available, and none of them actually have good mitosis things to them. So towards that end, what I recommend you do uh, is what I do when you're trying to find things, that uh, you um, go to the almighty Google. And when you've gone to the almighty Google, uh, you can find some things. A couple of things that I found here, this one was a decent site. None of these were good enough where I felt we should add them to our study tools. But we were just talking about being able to recognize histology slides. <clears throat> Typically, when you do this, to just give you a heads up to help you with your search so you don't have to just put in mitosis, uh, typically, when we're dealing with plant cells, which is what we're looking at here, uh, most of the time people use onion root tips. Uh, so that is what is commonly used for that. And then for animal uh, cells for mitosis, typically they use uh, what is called a white fish, which obviously is a type of fish, a blastula. The whitefish blastula is uh, basically a blastula is a stage in development as the egg is growing so that you can see them that way. So if you do some searches for those, you'll be able to find them. In the quick five minutes that I did this, I found some examples here and we can see some of the nice examples. Notice as we were talking about in interphase, you are gonna see a nice dark distinct border to the nucleus, a uniform cloud inside of it. Even a nucleolus can be present there. Whereas notice like this cell here or the example they've highlighted here or the example they've highlighted here or the example here and here. Notice in all of these, right, these three here, you see a dense continuous cloud of chromatin. Whereas here, it's broken up with light space. Right now in this one, you can still see the distinct border. This one's a distinct border. This one's got a fairly distinct border. Notice here, the border is starting to go away. As that border is starting to go away, I would say this one is getting closer to late prophase because we've got more distinct chromosomes here and uh, it is starting to no longer respect the boundary of the nucleus. Here would be another good example of a late prophase. We can see how these things are kind of spread out much more distinct and are not bound by a nucleus. Uh, one of the interesting things about plants is plants have a tremendous amount of genetic material in relation to their size, far more than animals. Our animal cells are going to be very, very tiny uh, when they're lined up. Uh, Sporkle, is that a website? Oh, that's cool. Oh, yeah, and lobster. The, the lobster activity has some good ones too. That's true. Um, <clears throat> uh, I'll have to write that down. Let me write that down so that I don't forget it. Sporkle. I've never heard of that site. Check it out. If it's good, I will add it to our study tools. Um, metaphase, uh, so in plant cells, because they have such much genetic material, it's not uncommon to see it kind of spreading out within the cell, but you can still see how it's very clearly on a line. Notice here is a great example. This is a test-worthy example of a late prophase. We can clearly see uh, the, the chromosomes are formed. They're not contained with a nucleus. They're spread out. Whereas here, they're condensed along the midline. And this is probably very late, early prophase. Again, notice you can kind of still see the border of the nuclear envelope in here. The metaphase, they're lined up. Anaphase, they're separated. And then telophase, they're starting to condense down. 
And as I mentioned, what you'll start to see, this is early in telophase, and we can tell this is early in telophase because there isn't that, uh, that cell wall that is starting to form here along the midpoint. So there isn't anything that is growing there. I think there was another page I found. Uh, that. This one here, uh, where it gave you some, oops, I guess I got to prepare my drawings. Uh, some nice examples. And what I liked about this one is here, you could actually see how that cell, that cell wall was forming, that cell plate was forming here. Here we still have nuclei, nuclei starting to form, uh, chromatin starting to uncoil, and then there's our daughter cells back in interphase again. So you can see that there. So again, just a quick search, found some nice examples of these that you could find uh, to see this. And I started, I, I started with the plant root tip, but you can look at other ones as well. All right, so again, you are definitely responsible for this thing, these things histologically. Uh, so make sure you are comfortable and familiar with that. All right, questions on any of that? Yes, and obviously our histology book, which is the whole point of having the histology book, has excellent examples in there as well. I was trying to look for some outside resources. Oh, excellent, perfect, page 24, I like that. Mm. I always enjoy our first break, because our first break is when I get to get my cup of coffee. And a nice hot cup of coffee just makes everything in the world better. All right. So, we are done with uh, physiology. Uh, we are done with mitosis. So let's move on to our plasma membrane. We have talked about the nucleus. We've talked about the cytoplasm. We've briefly mentioned the plasma membrane, but we need to talk about it a lot more. First talking about its structure and then the importance of its function. Now, as we already know, because we've said it numerous times, what is the primary structure? Phospholipids. There you layer. go, absolutely. Oh. I don't know why that keeps being so huge. Let's, I don't like that huge. Let's go there. Primary structure is indeed those phospholipids. And as you guys mentioned, they are arranged in a bilayer, right? Heads out, tails in. That is how they're gonna be oriented. This is important when it comes to our function. What is the function of the plasma membrane? To cell. allow some substances in and out, as yeah. well as being um, as holding everything in. Right, absolutely. You're absolutely correct. Its job is to form a barrier, right? We want to form a barrier. We want to separate what's inside the cell from outside mm -hmm. of the cell. But as you very importantly pointed out, we don't want it to be an impenetrable barrier. We do want to be able to allow some things to get in and some things to get out. It's kind of like a screen door. Right? If you've got a screen door on the front of your house, you can have that screen door closed and your normal door open, and it lets the breeze come in, you can hear the birds, you can smell the apple pie that your neighbor's baking, right? but your neighbor's dog can't get inside. The two-year-old that lives next door can't get inside unless they can jimmy the lock. Right? Exactly. There's the magic word we are looking for. It is a semi-permeable barrier. It is a semi-permeable. It allows some things in, but not others. And those phospholipids with that core tail uh, that, is, uh, that is hydrophobic helps to uh, form that. So obviously our membrane lipids are very, very important. And again, we talked about how it is the hydrophobic and hydrophilic characteristics of them that allow this to occur, right? But think of it this way. If I were to take, so let me go ahead and draw these while I'm explaining this. If I were to take a glass of water and very carefully on the surface of that glass of water, I poured a spoonful of oil, like olive oil over the top of it. What would happen? Emulsion, it's, it's, it's stay, stay at the top. Right, and not only would it stay on the top, but it would spread across the entire surface of the top, forming a film along the top of our glass of water. We all comfortable with that idea? It's not gonna mix in with it. It's gonna form just a layer over the top because the, the oil is gonna stay separated from the water. We're all comfortable with that concept. But that film of oil on the top is made up of all these different oil droplets. 
And does every oil droplet just find a location where it is gonna sit and it stays there? In my mind, I always picture back when my oldest daughter, Big, was in uh, kindergarten, uh, what she would do when we would go to their class and her class would do things, one of the activities they would do, the first thing we'd do before they would do any kind of physical activity like a dance or something, is everybody would stand up. And as everybody stood up, they swung their arms around them so that what would happen is everybody could space themselves in the class so that they had enough room between them all. So everybody would swing their arms until they were free of everybody else and they would find their spot and they would just stay there. That was their spot. Is that what happens with the oil droplets? An oil droplet finds its spot and it just stays there and it doesn't move? Is that what happens? No. Yeah. No, it is constantly moving. In fact, they have a fancy term for this. They say that it is a fluid mosaic. This fluid mosaic, what this means is on these phospholipids, these phospholipids arrange themselves perfectly in this, in this order because there is water up here and the heads are attracted to that and there's water down here and the heads are attracted to that and we, those tails don't like water so they point inward. It is the hydrophobic and hydrophilic characteristics that allow these to form this orientation. But once they form this, they don't just stay here. These phospholipids are constantly changing locations. So these two will change locations with each other, and these two will change locations with each other. And let's say, for instance, these two flip uh, or along the entire plasma membrane, one of these flips every second, or something along those lines. Again, these numbers aren't accurate, but it's a good illustration. Do you think it is possible for uh, phospholipids to switch from one layer to the other layer, to go this one to switch with that one? Do you think that's something that's possible? Yes, by layers. So it's... Yeah, it is actually possible, but it is a lot harder to occur. So for instance, if this happens, if one of these changes happens every second, then maybe this happens once every day. And again, these numbers are not accurate, but again, it gives you an idea. It's not very common, but it definitely is possible. So these phospholipids are constantly in motion. That is a good thing. It gives our plasma membrane a lot of flexibility, a lot of give, but if it's too loose, it's not gonna form an effective barrier. And that's where our cholesterol comes in. Remember we talked about this last time. Cholesterol we think of as being a bad thing, but it's not necessarily a bad thing. Remember cholesterols are made up of four carbon rings all put together with some functional groups and stuff like that attached to them as well. And even though I haven't done a good job of drawing this, I guess I'll have to sneak this down. Let's put that one down there and that down there. Hex, we'll do one more as well. Yeah, we'll just make it tiny there. All right, you guys get the idea. But um, with this one nestled here in between the uh, tails of these two phospholipids. If we were to name these three phospholipids, this one's A, and this one's C, and this one's B, are B and C as likely to change positions as A and B are? Which ones are more likely to change positions, A and B or B and C? A and B. A and B. Cholesterol is a very important part of the plasma membrane because it provides structure and support. It makes it so that it isn't too loose. It makes it so that it isn't too fluid because if it's too fluid, it's going to, um, well, it is not a bad example. Uh, actually, the example your book kind of uses that I kind of like is it's almost similar to like an antifreeze. Right, antifreeze gets in between the water molecules and stops the water molecules from boiling or stops the water molecules from freezing. So it gives that your engine coolant a wider range of function as a result of that. Uh, it does play a role in making the cells, but not here in our plasma membrane. That's gonna be more important when we look at digestion and the absorption of digestive materials. Uh, it, it, so there, the bile, the cholesterol in our bile helps to make cells. So that's more in our digestive system and not in the plasma membrane. But you're right, when we get to digestion, we, cholesterol also plays an important role in that. It's not forming cells here though. Here it is forming that 
structure, providing that support by getting in between the molecules. And when it gets in between the molecules, it helps to add more stability. Um, no, it's mostly uh, LDLs that are found in here. Again, when we talk about HDLs and LDLs, it's, we're more talking about found in the plasma of the blood. So we don't have to worry about making that distinction here, but it is more LDLs that I think you find in this region. All right. So when I say membrane lipids, so I do mean lipids plural, both phospholipids and cholesterol play a role in helping to form the uh, boundaries here of our plasma membrane. But there are other components that can be found in the plasma membrane as well. There are a large number of carbohydrates. Uh, a great example of this are what are called our glycocalyx or our sugar coat. Again, I'm gonna cheat a little bit and I'll just draw two little phospholipids here. Membrane carbohydrates are most commonly found on the outside of the plasma membrane. Again, they're going to be strings of carbon rings, our sugars on their outer coat. And these things, uh, one of the most common types is a type of carbohydrate known as a glycocalyx. What's the advantage of putting carbohydrates on the outer surface of our cell? What might it do? Well, what happens when you get sugar on your hands? Sure, it could provide energy, but if it's on the outside, is that really helping the cell? It might help something else, and it could play a role that way, but it doesn't help the cell. Right, what happens to your hand when you get sugar on the outside of your hand? It's sticky. It gets sticky, absolutely. And that's one of the big advantages of it. That, and in fact, it's called the sugar coat because what it does is it helps to make the cell sticky. So the cell stays in place, stays in its location. It helps to form stability to the tissues that that cell is gonna form. It helps to keep that cell arranged in its location. Joad, you said observe. What do you mean by observe? I say it's, uh, it, it's increasing the uh, observation of the, it helps the observation. Oh, I see what you're saying. Um, potentially, it could act as an attractant to be able to bring things to it. Absolutely, it could do something like that. See, I thought you were talking about observing, like making it more easy to be seen. And I like what Allison says there. Absolutely. It does help us to recognize the cell as being us. One of the important things we need to do is tell the difference between us and everybody else, everything else, right? So again, uh, holiday weekend's coming up. So of course, like all responsible adults, you're going to be going to Vegas for the weekend. And so you go, you get your bag together to go to Vegas and you have your nice little black rolling bag. Cause after all, if you're going to Vegas, you don't need much, right? Just a bathing suit and sacks of money and that easily fits into one of those rolling bags. But since 50,000 other people are going to Vegas as well, they don't let you take it on board and they take it from you and throw it into the luggage. And when you get to the luggage carousel, Right, not just yours, but 50,000 other black rolling bags come down that carousel as well. So how do you tell which ones are yours? Typically you have some key features, some characteristics, some tag on it to be able to tell <laughs> the difference between yours and everybody else's, okay. right? Mine, I have a big purple bow and a One Direction sticker on it, right? And those are the things that allow me to recognize mine from everybody else's. Right, so having those tags on the outer surface are something that is important for us to recognize cells that are us and cells that are not us. Now, they're not the only things that allow us to recognize us and not us. Proteins play an important role in that as well. We can have some proteins. Let's make our proteins yellow because it's fun. 
Uh, some proteins can indeed be on the outer surface and act as tags, those signals, those signs that let the cell know uh, what is us and what is not us. And when we talk about membrane proteins, they can come in a couple different flavors. They can be integral or they can be peripheral. An integral membrane protein is a membrane protein that is embedded within, oops, no, embedded within the phospholipid bilayer. So notice in this case, this particular protein that I have just drawn is located within one layer of our bilayer of our phospholipid. So it would be a part of it. And let's go ahead and expand this out a little bit more. So, oops, no, not that. That one. So there's then, and there's that. It's so much easier when I can draw it just with a drawing on the whiteboard. All right, excellent. So this one is embedded within the plasma membrane. And let's cheat and move this over here for now, because then that gives me space to draw this as well. Notice both of these are integral membrane proteins. Because they are embedded within the plasma membrane, either one layer or two layers. So both of those are integral membrane proteins. However, this particular one right here, because it goes through both layers, is what we also call a trans membrane protein because it goes all the way through. Now, peripheral membrane proteins are associated with the plasma membrane but are not directly attached to them. So I'm going to cheat and erase this one and instead draw it this way. So notice this one is associated with the plasma membrane on the outside. This one is associated with the plasma membrane on the inside. Most are on the inside, but there can be some on the outside. Often they are connected to integral membrane proteins, but they don't have to be. But so peripheral membrane protein is not in the plasma membrane, but is associated with the plasma membrane. And as we know, there are many types of proteins, so not surprisingly, there are many types of functions for these. Uh, for instance, some of these transmembrane proteins could be channels, and those channels could allow materials to get into or outside of the cell. Or it could be a receptor where a hormone binds to the top of it and affects some change on the inside. Or it could be an enzyme or it could be any number of different types of things. So we could have channels, transporters, movers, receptors, enzymes, cell markers, linkers, connecting cells together, massive number of proteins with massive different functions we're gonna talk about. It. And if you've noticed, my picture here has gotten kind of messy as we've looked at it. And not surprisingly, if we look at somebody else's illustration of the cell, we see that it is equally messy. So here we see some great examples of all those things we've talked about. Clearly the primary component is those phospholipids arranged in a bilayer. But notice embedded within the tails, we have those far four carbon uh, um, uh, uh, cholesterols helping to stabilize the plasma membrane. Here on green, primarily on the outer surface, we have those carbohydrates forming that glycocalyx that sugar coat on the outer surface. Here we have a transmembrane protein that allows for movement of materials in and out. So this is either a channel or some type of transporter. We will absolutely talk about facilitated diffusion and active transport. That's one of the things we're gonna talk about today. Absolutely, we're gonna to get to those things. Notice this is also an integral membrane protein because it is embedded within just one layer whereas this one also is a transmembrane protein, as this one is. And then notice we have some peripheral membrane proteins that are associated with the plasma membrane, but not actually attached to it. All right, 
So again, when we just draw that single line around the outside of the cell, as we can see, there's a whole lot more going on, a whole lot going on that we need to talk about its function. All right, questions on that? Uh, go back to the last slide. Yes, yes, I can. All right. So we've seen the pretty picture. We've talked about the components. And I didn't even have to do it real quick. I gave you a little bit more time. Then. All right. Excellent. Any other questions on that? All right. What we need to do now that we know the components of it, we need to talk a little bit more about what it can do. But we got to get back to that question about before about diffusion and active transport. And that is absolutely definitely something we want to be able to talk about. As we mentioned, our membrane is semi-permeable. Semi-permeable means that it allows some things through, but not others. So what are some of the things, and again, I'll just draw it as a simple line this time, although we know it's definitely more complicated than that. What are some of the things that are able to pass through that plasma membrane without any help at all? All right, water. Excellent. So we put water. We'll put a question mark by water. We'll talk about that as well. What else might be able to get through? Lipid base molecule. Excellent. Right? Like likes like. So something that is lipid based is going to be able to easily pass through those phospholipid tails. So lipid based molecules can pretty easily get through. Excellent. Are all proteins, the problem with proteins is many proteins are polar. And if a protein is polar, is it going to be able to pass through that plasma membrane without any help at all? No. However, nonpolar stuff should be able to get through. However, not necessarily all nonpolar selves. What, are, what else are we going to need these lipid or nonpolar things to be? Well, we're not talking about channels yet. We're just talking about getting through the plasma membrane without any help. We'll get to it proteins has, in a minute. It has to be small. Excellent. We need small, nonpolar, or lipid-based molecules. If you are small, if you are nonpolar, if you are lipid-based, you can pass right through that plasma membrane without any problem at all. And we just say that process is simple diffusion. No help, no problem. They just slide right through that phospholipid bilayer without any problem at all simple diffusion. And that brings us back to water. Water is definitely small, but is water nonpolar? No, water's polar. Is water lipid-based? No. Can water pass through the cell plasma membrane without any help at all? Yes, it can. It doesn't seem to, well, true, it can use aquaporins, but guess what? It doesn't need aquaporins. Water is actually a, water porins, aquaporins definitely make it easier, but those aquaporins aren't actually necessary. Water does pass through the phospholipid bilayer without any, well, that is the special magical word for it. You're absolutely correct. It passes through um, without any help. And the mechanism by which it occurs isn't fully understood. Here's what we believe, currently believe happens. As we know, water is ubiquitous. It is everywhere. So it has a huge, massive driving force. As someone mentioned, it wants to go from a high level of water to a low level of water. And as we also talked about, our plasma membrane has that fluid mosaic where the phospholipids are constantly moving around and changing positions. So what they believe what happens is as one phospholipid is moving, that opens up a little bit of a gap. And water is able to sneak through those cracks as the phospholipids move, and it is able to get inside of the cell that way. That does mean if we add more cholesterol and make the um, membrane firmer, it makes it harder for water to get through. And that's why things like aquaporins, special proteins, can make it in. Now, Water moving through the plasma membrane without any help is indeed simple diffusion. Yeah. 
of water. But water tends to be a special thing that does wonky things. And so not surprisingly, sometimes we give a special name to this simple diffusion of water. And someone already mentioned it, remind me again, it's still on the board, so I'll say it, Allison's got it right. The simple diffusion of water is osmosis. And osmosis is just the simple diffusion of water. All right. So lipid base, nonpolar, small things can get through by simple diffusion. Water, even though it doesn't seem to meet the criteria, is able to sneak in without any help. And indeed, we call that process osmosis. All right. So again, if you are <clears throat> small nonpolar lipid base to your water, you can get through that plasma membrane just by simple diffusion without any help at all. But if you're any of those other things we talked about, if you're large, if you're polar, if you're a protein or something like that, you need help. And that help, as you guys mentioned, is gonna come in the form, whoops, of either channels or transporters some type of integral membrane protein, and again, to be more specific, a trans membrane protein. Either a channel or a transporter. Now, anyone know what the difference between a channel and a transporter is? A channel is like a path and a transporter is like the helper. Not a bad guess. That's kind of right. We can be a little bit more than specific than that. You're on the right track. Uh, no, actually, both can be monitored. So that's both can be selective. When it comes to processes in the cell, the destination can differ from them as well. There's the magic word I was looking for, energy. When we talk about most processes in the body, uh, in the cell in particular, what we were concern ourselves with is whether it uses energy or whether it doesn't use energy. And again, when we talk about cell, what is the energy of the cell again? Adenosine triphosphate. Excellent. Adenosine triphosphate or ATP. Absolutely. Channels do not use ATP, whereas transporters use ATP. So, there are some fancy words we have for this. Something that does not use ATP, how do we refer to that? If a process doesn't use ATP, we say it is, or maybe it's easier if we do it the other way. If it uses ATP, what do we say it is? There we go, there, it's passive. Passive if it does not use ATP, and if it does use ATP, then what do we call it? Active, excellent. Perfect. So the big difference between channels and transporters are channels are passive. They do not use ATP. Transporters are active and they do use ATP. And we'll talk about some specific examples of those and why those are important in just a minute. All right. Perfect. However, before we get to these membrane proteins and channels and transporters and all these things, we need to talk a little bit more about this simple diffusion. And the good news, oh, actually, I lied. And if things are really large, there is another way we can move them into and out of the cell, and that is using vesicles. We've already actually talked about and identified the, the terms for these. But again, if we have a lot of something or something that's really big, we can bundle that stuff up into a vesicle, bring it to the plasma membrane, and expel it. And what did we call that process again? Exocytosis, excellent. And conversely, we can attach something to the outer surface of the plasma membrane, wrap our plasma membrane around it and bring it into the cell. And what did we call that process? Endocytosis. Endocytosis, excellent. So exocytosis and endocytosis using vesicles is another way we can get large things or large amount of things into and out of the cells. All right, excellent. Now, like I said, before we talk more about this, I wanna talk about the basic concept of diffusion, All right? Here we have diffusion, and I'm gonna cheat and get rid of this picture to allow me to play with my drawing, because I love to draw. 
All right, excellent. We have a nice, whoops, wrong button. Big fat pitcher. And in that big fat pitcher, we have it filled with water. And what I do is I take my packet of lemon lime Kool-Aid and I pour my lemon lime Kool-Aid packet into the pitcher. And when I drop all those crystals into my lemon lime, I'm pardon me, all those lemon lime crystals into my pitcher of Kool-Aid, do they just stay there cluttered together, holding themselves in the corner, scared and shuddering? No, they are gonna disperse. The reason for this is that these molecules have kinetic energy. And this kinetic energy causes random movement. And when we have this random movement, typically what happens, and really what diffusion is, is the random movement using that kinetic energy uh, from a high concentration to a low concentration. All right. So what happens is here we have a high concentration of crystals and those high concentration of crystals are gonna randomly move and as they randomly move, they're gonna disperse themselves throughout the pitcher until what happens? True, water is not moving in this case. In this case, the water is not moving. What's happening is it's the crystals that are moving. And as the crystals move, the crystals move. Uh, and, and again, do they all drop to the bottom and just huddle on the bottom? Is that what no. happens to the crystals? No. Some of them stay floating. True. Well, well what's going to happen is they are randomly going to disperse themselves throughout here. Yes, they dissolve into it and they randomly disperse until uniform. Excellent. Right, so what's going to happen is these crystals are basically going to randomly distribute themselves until they are at a uniform concentration throughout the entire pitcher. And I know my drawing skills aren't that great, but you get the idea. That point where they are now equally distributed throughout the entire pitcher. What do we call that point? What do we call the point we're now out there? Perfect, that's the magic term I was looking for. Equilibrium, right? At equilibrium, they are now randomly distributed throughout the entire pitcher, right? Now again, you can make Kool-Aid this way by pouring it in there and then letting it disperse. None of us like to do that though. So what do we do instead? We put the spoon in and stir. Mm -hmm. We put a spoon in and stir though. We are adding energy. Exactly. We're adding energy when we do that. So that's not passive. This is just simply passive diffusion. There is no energy going into this other than the kinetic energy of the molecules. Now, Here's the other key to equilibrium. We wanna make sure we define equilibrium properly. At equilibrium, are these uh, Kool-Aid crystals, like we talked about, are they like those kindergartners that are finding their spot, and once they find their spot, they stay there forever? No. Uh, we'll talk about hot water in just a minute. You got the right idea, Alfredo. We are gonna talk about things that affect it. Absolutely not. You are, so you are correct. These things are going to continue to move. The difference is that for every one crystal that moves to the left, one moves to the right. For every one crystal that goes up, one goes down, right? For every one that goes diagonally, another one goes diagonally as well. The definition of e equilibrium is not when there is no more movement. The key to equilibrium, there's lots of movement, but the key to equilibrium is there is no net movement. Think of it this way. If you have a pitcher of Kool-Aid, now I'm not going to assign this as a homework assignment, but maybe extra credit. 
if you were to sit and stare at a pitcher of Kool-Aid for 14 straight hours, would there ever be a period of time where suddenly you would see all of the Kool-Aid crystals move out of a particular area and there would be a little clear spot right in the center of that Kool-Aid because there's no crystals in that location? Would that ever occur? No, of course not. So once it reaches equilibrium, there is no net movement. There's still lots of movement, but every time something moves left, something else moves right. Every time something moves up, something else moves down. So there is no net movement. Or more specifically, really the key is there is no net change. All right. Now, that doesn't mean there aren't ways we can improve or modify the rate of diffusion. Oops, ah, I don't want that to be in caps. Someone, who was it? Alfreda, as we already mentioned, temperature. As we change the temperature, if we increase temperature, what happens to the rate of diffusion? Increases the, increases. Uh, the particles moving faster. Right, and if we decrease temperature, what happens to the rate of diffusion? Slow down. Slow down, all right. Uh, so, Maxim, what I'm saying is that, and again, I think the example of that, that we talked about before, when that pitcher reaches equilibrium, when it is evenly distributed with molecules, those molecules are still moving but they're not moving at a rate where there's a net change. Like I said, if you stared at a pitcher of Kool-Aid for 14 hours, there'd be no period of time where suddenly all of the molecules would move to the bottom and the top part would be clear or something like that. You get lots of movement, lots of, there's still lots of movement going on, but every time something moves left, something else moves right. Every time something goes up, something moves up. So there's no change. There's no change in the overall consistency of it. There's a lot of dynamic kinetic changes going, movement going on, but there's no net change. So net change would be one particle moved, but another particle would not move, that would mean, yes, exactly. And that's what we see at the beginning. Notice at the beginning, all these, uh, all these crystals are moving, but because there's a large dense amount of them here, more of them are moving away from that location than are moving into that location. And so in that case, there's no net change and that's how diffusion occurs. But once they equally distribute themselves, then there's no longer any net change. All right, so temp is one of the ways we can modify rate of diffusion. What's another factor that can change the rate of diffusion? Well, be careful. How do we, temperature is how we increase movement, is primarily how we increase movement. We don't want to add energy, so we still want it to be, uh, we still want to stay there. Uh, pressure can, but what do you mean by pressure? Again, if we're adding pressure to the outside, remember we're adding energy, so we want to be careful about that. How else can we increase the rate of diffusion? Or what other factors can affect the rate of diffusion? If we modify, oh, so, okay, let's think of that. So if we had a pitcher that had one gallon and I had a pitcher that had five gallons and I put the same amount of Kool-Aid in them, would they both reach equilibrium at the same time? No, which one would do first, the one gallon or the five gallon tank? The one gallon, because in the five gallon tank, the molecules have to move further. So you've got the right idea, the distance that has to be traveled uh, makes a difference. Absolutely. Uh, I saw someone, I don't want to go over, uh, size of the molecule, right? What uh, diffuses faster, large molecules or small molecules? Small, small ones are going to move. Excellent. All right. Surface area. I like that. Surface area is another example. We have to change our model a little bit for surface area. Uh, we'll talk, well, that's kind of what we're talking about now, Laura. Notice I've been talking about Kool-Aid crystals, but potassium, calcium, chloride, sodium, all of those work the same way as this one. 
All right. Now let's, we have to change our picture. We have to cheat a little bit to talk about surface area. So let me do this. Uh, I'll do a quick, easy swipe by just going ahead and drawing over that. And then I can redraw my picture. That is filled with water. I'm sorry, give me one moment, please. Sorry, my kid's school called, which is stupid because she's in the other room, but I apologize for that. All right, excellent. So I got my pitcher, I have my water, but this time what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a uh, plastic sheet, like a diaphragm down the center of my pitcher. All right, and now when I pour my Kool-Aid crystals into one side, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to then take a screwdriver and when I take that screwdriver, I'm going to poke a hole in that diaphragm. And when I do that, will diffusion take place? Will crystals move from one side of the pitcher to the other side of the pitcher? Yes, of course, because they're going to go from a high level to a low level. However, if I just poke one hole, am I going to get very rapid diffusion? No, but if I poke 15 holes in it, Am I gonna get a lot more diffusion then? Yes, so notice the more surface area, and so again, I apologize, I got, the more surface area for exchange that takes place, then the faster diffusion will occur that way as well. All right. I can think of at least one more factor that influences diffusion. Can anybody else think of a factor that influences diffusion? At least one more. Well, let's take another example. Ah, concentration gradient, excellent. That was the other characteristic I was looking for. Notice now I'm gonna take two pitchers of Kool-Aid and in this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do something similar to what I did last time. I'm going to put a diaphragm here in the center. And I am going to use a screwdriver. And with that screwdriver, I'm going to poke three holes in both of them. So both of them have the same surface area. Both of them, I'm going to put Kool-Aid in. So it's the same size molecule. But here in picture A, on this side, I'm going to pour in uh, 75 crystals of, um, so it's 75%, let's go ahead and make it 75%, Kool-Aid crystals on this side. And down here in picture B, I'm going to put 50% Kool-Aid crystals. All right, how many people think that diffusion will happen more rapidly in beaker A? No one? How many in beaker B? No one? All right, don't make, don't make me waste the time to actually go through and make a, uh, a poll that you guys are gonna have to do because I have to switch and then be able to go in there and write the question and come back. So give me A's and B's. Write them on the board, A's and B's, A's and B's. Who thinks it's gonna be faster, A or B? I got a neither, I like the neither. A, I got a B. It's still not 35 answers, so I'll tell you that right now, but we're getting a little bit better. But here's, maybe for those of you who don't answered, it didn't answer, maybe it's because you realize you didn't have all the information you needed. Because you don't know what's on the right side of these beakers. What if I told you on this side of the beaker over here, it was 70% Kool-Aid, and on this side of the beaker over here, it was 10% Kool-Aid. Which beaker moves faster? Which beaker has the highest rate of diffusion now? 
A or B? B. Notice a lot more people are saying B now. Because when we talk about it, it's not the absolute concentration, it's the concentration gradient. Right? By that I mean the difference between the two. The steeper the, 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 steeper the slope, the faster the uh, movement of our uh, solute. I'm going to have to steal right? your chair. Oh, shit. No, don't steal my chair. I need it. All right, excellent. So this, the difference is much greater here in B than it is in A. And so as a result of that, uh, it's going to go much faster in B. And again, let's make it simple. It's going to keep moving from, in this case, the left to the right until what happens? What's going to happen in this beaker B to make it reach equilibrium? When it reaches equilibrium, what's going to be at that point? What's the percentage of Kool-Aid over here on the left going to be when it reaches equilibrium? 30%. Excellent. And what's it going to be over here on the right when we reach equilibrium? 30%. Excellent. At that point, it reaches equilibrium. The two sides are equal to each other. Does that mean that there's going to be no more movement of Kool-Aid crystals? No. Remember, they're still going to move. There is just going to be, oops, I wanted to make that red. Uh, there's just going to be no net change. So at this point, there is no net change, and it is at equilibrium. So at this point, there's no net change. And yes, then at this point, the net movement would be zero. Plenty of molecules are moving to the left. Plenty of molecules are moving to the right. But the percentages aren't going to change because the movement is going to be equal. All right. All right. Let's look at the list that I came up with before to see if we hit everything. Concentration gradient, temperature, mass, distance it has to travel, surface area. Excellent. We got it all. So those are the factors that influence diffusion. All right. And so when we talk about movement into or out of the cell, it really doesn't have to be anything more, you know, spectacular than what we've been talking about. Let's draw a beaker one more time. And cheat. Getting rid of the top. And fill it with water. And put our diaphragm down the center. And we take our screwdriver and we take our screwdriver, we poke those holes. When we poke those holes, and really these holes would be examples of channels. Because remember they are passive and really they're just holes in the wall. If you look up, probably whatever room you're in has a door in it and more specifically a door frame. That door frame is a hole in the wall. And does that hole in the wall decide which direction you move? No, it's your driving force that determines which way you want to move. So if I tell you over here, on this side, there is 50% glucose or 50% sodium or 50% potassium or something along those lines. Which way is that sodium, which way is that glucose going to move? Anybody know? No, because I haven't told you what's on the other side. What if on this side, I tell you there is 20%. Which way is it going to move now, left or right? Move to the right. What if instead I tell you over here it's 70%. Which way is it going to move now? It's going to move to the left. So notice these channels, these holes are bi-directional. Things can move either direction through them. It is totally the driving force of the, whoops. It is totally the driving force of the molecule 
that determines the direction it moves. And it always moves from a high concentration to a low concentration. Again, this is not a concept that is foreign to you guys. It's like a ball. If I stand at the top of a hill holding a ball and I let that ball go, what's the ball gonna do? Roll down. It's gonna roll down the hill, absolutely. Because when I'm standing there, it has a lot of potential energy. And when I let it go, it rolls down the hill and I don't have to use any energy to get that boulder all down the hill. It rolls down the hill on its own. And that's exactly how passive diffusion works. Passive diffusion does not need any energy. It's just the kinetic energy. And those molecules move from a high concentration to a low concentration on their own. However, what happens when I wanna get that ball back to the top of the hill? You need to use energy. Then I need to use energy. Typically, if I want to get something to go against its concentration gradient, then I have to use energy. I have to use energy. And to use energy, it requires a special protein. And that special protein is a transporter, or what are also sometimes referred to as pumps. And they use ATP to move the molecule. And if we're using ATP to use the molecule, usually, there's that pesky word, obviously that means there are gonna be some exceptions, but usually uh, we are doing it, move it against its concentration gradient because we're get, trying to get it to go someplace it doesn't want it to go. Now, Haley, just for clarification, this right here, this part right here, that is facilitated diffusion. Facilitated diffusion is when we typically have a channel, right, a protein that forms the hole. For things to go through. Remember, simple diffusion is when it can just pass through the plasma membrane without any help at all. So simple diffusion is when it's able to just zoop right through the plasma membrane without any help. If something needs help to diffuse, it needs that protein, and that is our facilitated diffusion. Channels are what allow our facilitated diffusion. They're that hole in the wall, right? Think of it this way. If you're in a mall, and you want to get upstairs in the mall, you have two choices. You can use your energy to go up the stairs, or you can use the energy of the mall by riding up the escalator, right? None of you can get upstairs by yourself. You can't just jump from the bottom floor to the top floor. That's not going to happen. You need help. So if you're taking the stairs, you're using your energy and that would be facilitated diffusion. They've got the stairs there to help you. <laughs> there you go, elevators, exactly, would be another example. You're using your energy. They have the stairs to allow you to use your energy, but you're using your energy. The stairs don't move. You do to get upstairs. If you take the escalator or if you take the elevator, the mall is using their energy to move you up to the top. And so that would be a transporter. The escalator and the elevator are transporters. The stairs are facilitated diffusion, All right? If you're a bird, you can just fly. You don't need any help. That would be simple diffusion. All right, excellent. And let's clear that. All right, so you're right, the bird would be using its own energy, but again, we would consider that all molecules, remember, have their own kinetic energy that they're using. So yes. The same way you're using your energy to walk up the stairs. Just you need stairs, the bird doesn't need stairs. The bird can do it on its own. All right. Now, notice as we've talked about then, the big determining factor the direction and ion flows 
is its driving force. And there are two key factors that determine its driving force. Those two key factors that determine the driving force are, as we've already talked about, its concentration gradient, but also there is going to be an electrical gradient. Let's talk about the easy one first. Let's draw our cell. And let's start with some information we already know. We know that there is an unequal distribution of ions inside and outside of a cell. Where is there more sodium, inside the cell or outside the cell? Outside, so there's lots of sodium outside the cell and only a little sodium inside. What about potassium? Inside the cell. Lots inside. Lots of potassium inside the cell and only little potassium outside. And let's not just focus on the cations. What is our most common anion again? Chloride, and where is there more of that, inside the cell or outside the cell? Outside, excellent. So there's lots of chloride ions outside the cell and only a little bit of chloride inside. Excellent. No new information there. That's all stuff we've already talked about and hopefully makes some semblance of sense. So what we'll do here in red is to focus on our concentration gradients. And our concentration gradients, remember as we talked about, things wanna move from a high concentration to a low. So what direction is the concentration gradient, if we come over here and make it a little bit smaller, for our potassium? our concentration gradient, or we could also think of it as our concentration force. So we'll abbreviate it over here. Oops, hold on. There we go. there and that goes there. All right, if we are going to talk about the chemical force, oh, not concentration force, I'm sorry, I meant chemical force. Let's erase that too. Get rid of that, get rid of that, make this red, not good gravy. Chemical force. When we talk about the chemical force, and so I'll abbreviate this CF, what direction is the chemical force on potassium? Potassium wants to go from a high concentration to a low concentration. So is the chemical force inside, going inside or going outside? Excellent, from inside going out. So our chemical force is moving out. What about the chemical force of sodium? What direction is the chemical force of sodium going? It's going inside the cell, excellent. And the chemical force of chloride, Excellent. Also from outside to inside. Excellent. Those are the chemical forces on these particular ions. Okay. However, there is another effect of there being an unequal uh, uh, spread of ions across the plasma membrane. Because these ions are charged particle, positive and negatively charged particles, it turns out there is also 
an unequal spread of positive and negative ions inside and outside the cell. And as it turns out, the inside of the cell is more negative than the outside. We actually call this its membrane potential. We call this its membrane potential. The membrane potential of the cell is more negative on the inside than it is on the outside. And we can actually give a value to it. That value to it is negative 70 millivolts. So the inside of the cell here is negative 70 millivolts. Oops. Ugh. Oh, that's the problem. There we go, millivolts. At this point, the cell is happy. And so we actually call this its resting membrane potential. If you leave this cell alone and the cell doesn't have to do any work, it will happily stay at negative 70 millivolts on the inside versus the outside forever. All right. And yes, Haley, in a real world, uh, again, they do vary from cell to cell, but remember in this class, the sky is blue. So with the sky is blue, every single cell's memory potential is negative 70 millivolts. Now, of course, that's not really true, but for our purposes, that's what we're going to use. That is going to, if you've noticed up to this point in time, there aren't a ton of numbers I'm going to hold you responsible for. Numbers are often the kind of things that you guys can look up to, uh, you know, to, to find in other locations, but there are going to be some important numbers, and this is definitely one of them. Negative 70 millivolts is the resting membrane potential of our cells. So notice because of this and because our ions are charged particles, there is going to be an electrical force. Because anybody who's ever played with magnets know, do positive things like other positive things or do positive things like negative things? Negative. Right. Positive things like negative things. Absolutely. So the electrical force is going to be based on the charge of the ion. So, for instance, let's talk about sodium. Sodium is a positively charged ion. And as a positively charged ion, is its electrical force going to be to come into the cell or to go out of the cell? The inside of the cell is negative. It's a positively charged ion. So does it want to come into the cell or does it want to go out of the cell? Well, do positives like negatives? Yeah, so absolutely, it is going to want to come into, oops, don't want to use red. It is going to want to come into the cell. Notice for sodium, both its chemical force and electrical force are both into the cell. One of the things we're going to learn is sodium really, really, really wants to get inside of cells. Really, really badly. And that's a good thing. We can actually let sodium come into the cell to do work for us. It's one of the important things we're going to do. We're going to say, all right, sodium, you really, really, really want to come into the cell? You can come into the cell, but you got to do some work for me. And so that's one of the ways we're actually going to get the cell to do work. Notice with potassium and chloride, it's a little different. Potassium's chemical force is driving it out, but it is a positive ion. So as a positive ion, what is its electrical force, in or out? Remember, positive things want to go to negative things, so it is going to want to go in. The inside of the cell is negative, potassium is positive, so it wants to go in. Its electrical force is going to be to go in. Chemical force is out, but electrical force is in. We're just talking about the charge. We're not talking about anything else. Positive ions want to be where it's negative. But what about negative ions? Do negative ions want to be where it's negative? No. No. So guess what the electrical force of chloride is? Going into the cell or coming out of the cell? Out of the cell. Out of the cell, absolutely. So the electrical force of chloride is going to be to go out of the cell. So these forces, these chemical forces and electrical forces are going to determine which way ions are going to flow. Because ions are going to want to reach equilibrium. And for an ion to reach equilibrium, 
Sir, can I jump in and ask you a question? No, let me write this first and then oh. I'll answer your question. Okay. For ions to reach equilibrium, the chemical force and electrical force must be equal and opposite. At that point, there would be no net movement of the ion and it would be at equilibrium. All right, now I will happily answer your question. So as we said that the potassium has a positive ion, which is a cation, and uh, the electric, uh, electric force of the uh, potassium should be inside. Yes. So how are, we gonna, how are we gonna keep the equilibrium? Like how are we gonna reach equilibrium if it is positive and still it's positive inside the, the it, it doesn't go outside? Great question. So here are the two things to remember. The two things to remember is that while like in the case of potassium, there is a chemical force and an electrical force, these two forces are not equal to each other. As it turns out, the chemical force is way, way bigger than the electrical force coming in. So if I open up a potassium channel, guess which way potassium is going to move? Outside? Yeah. So the net is going to be out, absolutely. So the net is going to be out, right? Because the two forces are not equal to each other. If we can get the two forces to be equal to each other, then potassium will be happy. Potassium will be at equilibrium. And if potassium is at equilibrium, potassium is happy. However, is the cell going to be happy when it's in, at equilibrium? No. No. And that's the key here. Resting membrane potential is when the cell is happy. Not the ions. The ions aren't happy at, at resting membrane potential. That's why we're able to get them to do work, is because they're not happy. And the other thing to remember about ions, our ions are like two-year-olds. What does a two-year-old care about? Themselves. Themselves, absolutely. They don't care anything. They will cut you with a knife to get what they want, right? Two-year-olds are horrible, horrible people, right? All they do is care about themselves. And that's all potassium cares about. All potassium cares about is itself. It doesn't care about the cell or sodium or chloride or anything. It wants to be at equilibrium. So anytime you open a door, potassium is going to leave because it's going to try to reach equilibrium. Anytime you open a sodium door, sodium is going to come in because it's going to try to reach equilibrium. And that's really the key to this. By having these cells, have a I mean, having these ions, having a driving force, they want to come in, they want to move. And when we open them, those open those channels, they do move. And that's how we get the cell to do work. So we get the cell to do work by allowing these things to move. All right. These things are constantly moving. There are things we call leak channels that are open all the time. So there is a, so let's make this brown so we can emphasize this point. There are sodium leak channels where sodium is constantly coming into the cell. So there's constant sodium coming into the cell. There are also potassium leak channels. where potassium is constantly leaving the cell, right? Think of the problem about this. If one sodium comes in and one potassium leaves, one positive thing has come into the cell, one positive thing has left the cell, have we changed the membrane potential of the cell? No, if one positive thing came in and one positive thing left, then the membrane potential of the cell is the same and the cell is happy. Uh, chemical force for sodium and chloride is not greater than the electric force. No, actually, in, in all cases, it is in, in all, great question. In all of the cases, as it turns out, the chemical force is indeed greater. So there and there, chemical force is greater. But notice in sodium, it doesn't matter because both the electrical force and the chemical force are the same direction. 
So it really doesn't matter which one's greater. But yes, the chemical forces are typically greater. So when you open a chloride channel, chloride comes in. When you open a potassium channel, potassium leaves. When you open a sodium channel, sodium comes in, but both forces for sodium are to come in. So that one really doesn't matter. All right, but here's the issue as we were talking about before. If one sodium comes in and one potassium leaves, we haven't changed the membrane potential, but the cell, so the cell stays happy, but we've lost some of our chemical gradient, concentration gradient, and that can stop the cell from being able to do work. So one of the important things this cell has is this cell has a very special pump, a transporter, and this transporter is called the sodium potassium ATPase or what is also known as the sodium potassium pump. Both of those are appropriate terms, sodium potassium pumps. Its job is to use, it's a pump, it's an ATPase, so it uses ATP and it uses that energy to do two things. That sodium that comes in, oh no, way too big. That sodium that comes in, it kicks it out. That potassium that leaves, it brings it back in. And it doesn't just kick out one sodium, it actually kicks out three sodiums. It doesn't just bring back one potassium, but it brings back two potassiums. So one ATP allows us to kick three sodiums out and bring two potassium back in. So notice sodium comes in and then it's kicked right back out. Potassium leaks out and then it's brought right back in. And notice equal numbers, three sodium kicked out. How many potassium get brought back in? Two, three sodium out, but only two potassium back in. So notice three positive things are kicked out of the cell, but only two positive things are brought back in. This is one of the things that helps to keep the cell negative on the inside. When a cell is at rest, about 25% of its energy is used just on this sodium potassium pump, helping to kick out these ions, maintain that concentration gradient, keeping the cell at its resting membrane potential, so that the cell can do work when the time to do work. All right. Let's take a look. I've done this drawing here. Let's take a look at the pretty pictures that show this as well. So again, as we mentioned, there is an unequal distribution of ions across the plasma membrane, more potassium on the inside, more sodium on the outside, right? More chloride on the outside and so on and so forth. But the inside of the cell is negative, the outside of the cell is positive. So we have both a chemical force and an electrical force that help to determine how things move. And they form the electrochemical gradient. This is determines how ions are gonna move. All right, questions on that? All right, excellent. This is a good point for our next break. We still have a little bit more to go, but again, things get a little denser from here. Not that this wasn't dense, but it gets worse. Not worse, different, same, I don't know, whatever. But let's, this is a good point for a break. Let's go ahead and take our second break. Uh, it is 1045 now, so we will restart at 11. And I will start the recording at that point time. And I will remember to pause the recording this time so you don't get 15 minutes of dead space. So. All righty. Let's go ahead and get started. Any questions before we dive back in? All right, excellent. Now that we've had a chance to talk about some of the driving forces, one of the driving forces we want to talk about is the diffusion of water. Now, as we talked about, osmosis is what we call it, but osmosis really is just diffusion of water. It, we give it a fancy name, but it's really the exact same concept. And I don't like 
confusing rules. I like having one rule that works a lot for everything. So I like that. So let's go ahead and go and draw our picture again. Here's our picture. And as we've talked about, we put that diaphragm down the center. And I use my screwdriver. And with my screwdriver, I poke three holes in my diaphragm. And as we've talked about over here on this side, we are going to put 60% Kool-Aid or whatever it is here. So or let's just say glucose, but it could be anything, right? Sodium, potassium, whatever. And on this side over here, we put 30% uh, As we now understand, when we do this, which way is our glucose going to move? Excellent. Glucose in this case is going to move to the right and it will continue to move to the right until what happens? Equilibrium. equilibrium. Excellent. Until equilibrium is reached. Absolutely. And equilibrium would be what in this case? 45. Excellent. So it'd be 45% on this side, and it would be 45% glucose on this side. And let's actually again remind ourselves that coast there. and 45% glucose on this side. Again, at that point, is there any movement taking place? No net movement. There you go. Yes, movement absolutely is taking place, but absolutely you are correct in that the key at this point is at this point there is no net movement. All right. No new information there. That all makes perfectly good sense to us. Yes, hopefully. I'll pretend that the answer to that is yes. Excellent. But I have another question for you. When we talk about something like this being 60% glucose, what's the other 40%? Hydrogen. Isn't it water? It's exactly what it is. Absolutely. This is 40% water. And what does that make this one over here? What's this one over here then? 70% water. 70% water. Excellent. Now, as we talked about before, if I just took the, my screwdriver and I poked those holes into uh, my membrane, then again, the glucose is going to move and the water isn't because we have the forces of the water from the two sides and it is going to stay the same. However, if instead of using uh, my screwdriver to poke holes, if I was able to put some special type of protein, and that special type of protein filled, whoops, let's do this, this space. If I put these special proteins in here, and these proteins allowed water to move, but did not allow glucose to move. Let's say they were very tiny holes. Water is tiny, two hydrogens and an oxygen. Glucose is six carbon rings and all the functional groups. So if there were these tiny little holes that allowed water to move, but didn't allow the glucose to move, what would happen? Would water move in this case? No, you don't actually need energy. This is a passive process. Remember, osmosis is a passive process. So I'm not using any energy. I'm not using any ATP, but water will absolutely move. And which way will water move in this case? 70 to 40%. Yeah, water is going to move to the left. Absolutely. Water is going to move to the left. The reason it moves to the left, as we've learned about with diffusion, Diffusion is the role where things move from a high concentration. Oops. To a low concentration. That is the, uh, what we know. We know that's what diffusion is. And that's exactly what water does. Now, if you've taken like biology 400 or some other type of micro class or something along those lines, exactly, that's what I was going to say there, then you might have learned the phrase of something along the lines of water follows salt or you know, water 
follows stuff where basically wherever there is more wa uh, stuff, that is where water wants to move. So water wants to move to where there's more stuff. And if you've learned that, and that's a concept that you are comfortable with, then I'm perfectly fine with you continuing to use that. But like I said, I don't like new rules. I know diffusion, no matter what the diffusion is, whether that diffusion is of a solute, uh, like glucose or a solvent like water, things move down the concentration gradient. Glucose moves from a high level to a low level. Water moves from a high level to a low level. So when we talk about uh, diffusion of water, because it is a passive process, it moves from a high level uh, to a low level of concentration. And again, by concentration, I mean concentration of water, not concentration of solutes. We're talking about the concentration of the solvent. Now, like I said, if you've learned that water follows salt or water follows stuff and that helps you to remember the way water goes, I'm perfectly fine with that. Now I've drawn this here, but back in ancient times, right, there was YouTube. And by YouTube, I don't think mean the thing that I've got on my videos on now. I mean this. Back when I was in graduate school, this was our YouTube, all right? It was a tube in a U shape. And uh, what happened was you would put equal amounts of water on both sides, but different amounts of glucose on the two sides. And it would have a special membrane down the center where notice the pore of this membrane is way too small for our glucose to be able to pass through it, but water can. So again, as you can think of it, and either way is acceptable, Water has a high concentration here. It's going to load to go to a low concentration or water is going to move to where there's more stuff. Either way, in this YouTube, water will actually move until the concentrations on the two sides are equal. Notice the volume is not equal, but the concentrations are equal. And that is the key. This is the picture from your class, uh, from your textbook that does a nice job of showing this. I have a different picture. And what I like about this picture is it emphasizes the difference in the water molecules. Notice they've showed the water molecules are tinier, so they're able to go through the holes. There's more water on the left, less water on the right, more glucose on the right, less on the left. And again, it moves to the right till the concentrations are equal. Now, once the concentrations are equal like this, is there any way to get the water to go back to the other side, to get the water to go to the left? Is there a way in this YouTube that I could get the water to go back to the left side? Well, I'm asking the question, so what should the obvious answer be? The obvious answer, if I'm asking the question is? Pressure. Yes, the answer is yes. What kind of pressure though? Because this movement of the water is osmotic pressure. This movement of water wanting to go down its concentration gradient, water wanting to go to where there's more stuff, is a pressure that we call an osmotic pressure. So if we are going to get it to go back in the other direction, what kind of pressure do we need to use? Not osmotic pressure, but we need to put a force on the water, absolutely. And that force we put on the water is hydrostatic pressure. If I were to put a weight on that, that force applied to the water, that hydrostatic force, that hydrostatic pressure can force the water back to the opposite side. So the opposite of our osmotic pressure is our hydrostatic pressure. All right. Questions on that? All right, excellent. That is our diffusion and diffusion of water. And again, this is important. This concept of where water moves in relation to a cell is important, All right? I know this morning when I got up and went for my walk, it was beautiful outside. I dare say it was chilly. 
However, this past weekend, it still got pretty darn hot. And if it's 100 degrees outside, do you necessarily want to be on top of your roof, tarring your roof? Is tarring the roof in 100 degree weather necessarily a fun thing to do? No, absolutely not. And if you try it, especially if you got to be all manly about it, and so you can't have water up there because water doesn't isn't manly, right? And so the next thing you know, you're being wheeled into the hospital for dehydration. And because you're so dehydrated, they get a nice big, huge bottle of... Uh, you know, deionized water, right? Like some Aquafina or something like that. And they insert that straight into your vein, right? Nice big bottle of, uh, of Aquafina straight into your veins is a good thing. Get all that water in there as quickly as possible. No, of course not. Because as uh, Joe Edmesson mentioned, there is the tonicities of the water, right? It matters what is in it, right? Ideally, instead of being uh, deionized water, you want to use something like a lactated ringer a lac or, or a 0.9% sodium chloride. In that case, and again, let's cheat and draw our pitcher. Here's our pitcher. Here's our water. And here is our cell. Our cell, as we know, has water and stuff inside of it, a certain amount of stuff. And ideally, we want to have uh, it surrounded by water and stuff that is the same amount. If we have the same amount of water and the same amount of stuff, both inside and outside, we get an even movement of the materials. And let me actually make that a little bit smaller. There we go. Erase that one. Even movement of substances into and out of it. And we would call that an isotonic solution. And our cell's happy. When we're at an isotonic solution, our cell's gonna be happy. If instead, as I mentioned, we use that bottle of Aquafina, that aquafina is basically just water. Oops. 100% water and zero stuff. If we put a cell in an environment where there is nothing but water and no stuff, what's going to happen here? You're absolutely right. We would call this a hypotonic solution. And in this hypotonic solution, what would happen? Excellent. Water goes down its concentration gradient, or water goes to where there's more stuff. The water would go inside the cell, the cell would swell, and in some instances, not only would it swell, but it could actually burst, or the fancy word, we could say the cell would lice. Oops, lice. As a result of that. All right? Or let's flip it the other way around. You're out boating this weekend out on the ocean because you got the nice three day weekend and your boat capsizes and you are stuck outside in the ocean salt water. Well, you're surrounded by water, so there's no problem all. So you can just guzzle some of that down and drink all that salt water and be perfectly happy, right? In fact, every time you go to the beach, you should get a nice bucket of salt water uh, right out of the ocean and guzzle it down, right? Because that's good for you. Water's good, it's important to stay hydrated. No. Nope. No, absolutely. You should not do that. And the reason you should not do that is because that salt water has more stuff in it. It's not the same concentration of stuff inside of it that we have inside of our body. And as someone mentioned, this would be an example of what we would call a hypertonic solution. In the case of the hypertonic solution, when you put that cell in that environment, what happens? Water goes down its concentration gradient. Water goes to where there's more stuff and the cell actually shrinks up. And if this is a red blood cell like the one here, we have a special name for that. We say crenation. This is actually what happens to a lot of people who are capsized 
in their boat and exposed to water for a prolonged period of time, right? We always worry about the sharks and, you know, uh, you know, uh, giant uh, squids and things like that capturing us and pulling us under the water and gobbling us up when we're stuck there. But oftentimes when someone's capsized and stuck in the water for long periods of time, that salt water is constantly drawing water out of the body, dehydrating the body. And so it is very, very dangerous in that fashion by pulling that out. And that would be that hypertonic solution. So absolutely, the t tonicity, how much water, how much stuff is there, and that movement is really important. So again, that hypertonic solution draws the water out, and like I said, for a red blood cell, causes crenation, and a hypotonic solution would cause the cell to swell and could actually cause the cell to burst or to lice as a result of that. All right, questions on that? All right, excellent. So now that we have talked about that, and how do I want to do this? Let's do this first. Okay, perfect. Membrane transport. When we talk about moving across a membrane, now that we've talked about this concept, there are passive and active types. And again, what is the difference between passive and active? What's passive, right? The difference is energy. So let's be specific. Passive transport is what? No energy and specifically no ATP is used in the process. Again, you gotta be careful. Remember we're using kinetic energy, but it, no ATP is used for this. Instead, it's primarily the driving force of the ions that causes the movement where in active transport, we are either gonna directly or indirectly use ATP. And if we're using that energy, then typically it is, oops, ugh, is to move ions or substances, let's say substances, against their concentration gradients. All right, we're comfortable with those definitions. So again, we have our uh, active and passive transports. So and let's do this, so I'm gonna do this on the whiteboard first and then we will come back and do this here. So let's go ahead and go to our whiteboard. I'm pretty sure I saved this, but I'll save this again just in case so that I can go ahead and clear it. And let's start easy here is our plasma membrane. Let me raise that up a little bit. Well, let's first make it straight. There we go, close enough. And then move it up. All right, excellent. So let's talk first about passive transport. Too small. Again, passive transport does not require ATP. And there are really two, three types depending on how you wanna think of it, all right? The first type of passive transport is just simple diffusion. Remind me again what simple diffusion was. Someone tell me what simple diffusion was again. So in this, uh, in the simple diffusions, uh, stuff uh, moves uh, uh, from an area of high concentration to the an area of low concentration of solutes. Okay, but if we're moving across the membrane, what's the other characteristic? You're right. It is going to move from a high concentration to a low concentration. Ah, well, nonpolar. Yeah, Haley's got the key. The key to simple diffusion is that it passes through the plasma membrane with no assistance, just straight passes through the plasma membrane, All right? So if we were to draw this with an arrow, that arrow 
is going to pass straight through the plasma membrane without any help at all. And remind me again, what types of things can move through simple diffusion? Nonpolar, small size. So it's a small, nonpolar, or mm. molecule. Small, nonpolar, or what else? Lipid based. Lipid, yeah. Excellent. All right, perfect. There's also simple diffusion 2.0, right? Which is really, there was one other thing that can simply diffuse. And what was that other thing that can simply diffuse as well? Water. All right, absolutely. Now again, diffusion of water is just simple diffusion, but Water is pretty important, so we give this simple diffusion of water a special name. And what is that special name of the simple diffusion of water? Osmosis. osmosis. Excellent. So osmosis is simply just the simple diffusion of water. And it again passes through the plasma membrane without any help at all. All right. So far, so good? Excellent. All right, so that is simple diffusion. Anything that isn't water or isn't small nonpolar or lipid then needs another way to get through. And one of those is what we call, and this was a term that was used earlier, facilitated diffusion. Facilitated diffusion again is passive in its movement, meaning no ATP is moved. We use the driving force of the molecule. However, facilitated means that it needs help. And in this case, uh, the help comes in the form of a protein. And they're basically types. Uh, there are either channels or carriers. All right. So this is our second type of diffusion. I guess you could think of it as a third, because again, osmosis, we could think of as a third type if you wanted to. And again, I wouldn't mark you wrong for saying that, but you could also consider osmosis part of simple diffusion. Uh, so it's either three or one A, I guess. However you want to think of that, I don't care. As long as you, again, I don't care how you organize, as long as if I ask this question, you give me all of these. So yeah, we have carrier mediated or channel mediated uh, facilitated diffusion. So what we need to do is we need to explain what the heck the difference between a channel and a carrier is. A channel, and actually I'm gonna cheat and draw this up here so that I have, more, uh, the channel is a static protein. What do I mean by static? Not change. It doesn't move. Exactly. Basically, it is a structured hole. And in fact, we have a name for the structured hole. The hole of a channel is the pore. So our door frame, I keep using the example of a door frame. A door frame is a channel. It is a hole in the wall that you can pass through. And so that's basically what we have. What we have here is a protein and I'll make a very simple version of this. Here is a protein, here is a protein, and of course in between them there is going to be an open space. There we go. So that is a channel. It is a hole and of course the channel has a hole and that hole is the pore. And molecules are able to move in whichever direction based on their driving force. Now, much like your door frame, your door frame has a hole in it. It's a hole in the wall, but it also has a door connected to it as well. And that door can be open and closed. That door can be locked. So just because it's passive doesn't mean that it can't be selective right? The door to the front of your house lets you in, but you can't get your car in your front door 
an elephant couldn't get in your front door. And when you leave the house, you can lock your front door. So it can be selective, it can be gated, it can be specific. There can be a channel that just lets sodium in or just lets potassium out. So just because it's passive doesn't mean it can't be selective, doesn't mean that it can't be uh, gated. But the other problem we have is there's sometimes larger molecules we need to let in. And glucose is a great example. For those, we have carriers. Carriers are dynamic proteins, meaning, of course, that they change shape. However, the key to them is that the energy to change shape comes from the molecule passing through. How many people here have been to the Sacramento Zoo? I don't necessarily mean today, but at least a couple of you. Excellent. Perfect. Several of you, more of you. When you leave the Sacramento Zoo, how do you leave the Sacramento Zoo? Excellent. There's this big, huge metal turnstile. If you want to get out of the Sacramento Zoo, there's a big, huge metal turnstile. Now, if you stood by that turnstile, eventually is someone from the zoo going to come and plug it into an outlet in the wall where they use their energy and their fuel and their resources to spin that turnstile for you so you can just walk out? No. If you want to get out of the zoo, you have to push on that turnstile. And when you push on that turnstile, the turnstile changes shape and you are able to get out. So you have to do the work to get out and the zoo doesn't use any energy. And that's essentially what a carrier is. Now I haven't had to do this before. Let's see if I can draw one of these. Uh, let's make it thick. Excellent. So again, it's gonna be comprised of proteins. So here is one protein and here is a second protein. And what's special about this protein is that it has a special binding site on it. So let's get rid of the middle part here. So this would be an example of a carrier. With this carrier, what happens is a molecule like a glucose is going to come in. And when it comes in, it binds, whoa, way too big. it is going to bind to that binding site. And when the, the glucose binds to the binding site, it undergoes a conformational change. There's a fancy term we've heard before. What does that mean to undergo a conformational change again? Excellent, it means it changes its shape. When the glucose binds to it, it changes its shape and when it changes its shape, what it ends up doing is it ends up switching so that now it faces, whoops, now it's oriented in the other direction. And now that it's oriented in the other direction, our glucose can let go and it is now inside the cell. And so what happens is the glucose comes in, it changes shape to let the glucose in. And once the glucose lets go, guess what happens to our carrier? changes shape back to its original shape. Notice the cell is not using any energy in this process. It is using the energy of the glucose to change its shape to let things in. Notice the advantage of things like this carrier is it allows us to let bigger things into the cell. 
if we had a hole in the cell big enough, like a channel, a hole in the cell big enough for glucose to come in, all sorts of other stuff would come in as well. And we don't want that. So by having this carrier, something that changes shape, we can let big things in and still be selective and still limit what's able to get inside. All right, questions on this. All right, I've done an amazing job of drawing this because again, I'm amazing. But let's look at the pretty pictures from your textbook to go through this a little bit more. With our passive, we have simple diffusion and facilitated. We've talked about the differences between channels and carriers. And again, with our channel mediated facilitated diffusion, it's passive, it can be specific, it can be gated. And here we see an example of this from your textbook. Notice this is a potassium channel. It is a protein that is embedded with the plasma membrane, a transmembrane protein. We're seeing half of it here. And it has a hole in the center, the pore, that allows potassium to flow. Again, it is selective. I'll go back to my uh, drawing in just a second because uh, we're, we're going to finish it some more. But I wanted to show these pictures from your textbook first to make sure it makes sense. All right. Um, so it allows it to go through. So it's selective. Only potassium can go through them. But notice it also can be gated. There are two additional proteins here. Notice one of these proteins is big and globular. The other one is long and linear. These actually have a very technical name to them. They're referred to as the ball and chain. And notice the ball of this can wedge itself in the pore. And when it wedges itself in the pore, potassium cannot go through it anymore. All right, so we have our a pore. Now it's closed, here it's open. So it can be selective, it can be gated, but it's just a hole. It doesn't change shape. Carrier mediated facilitated diffusion uses proteins, but notice these proteins are only open on one side. So again, it's passive, but it allows larger molecules into the cell. And again, the key to this is that fancy word, our protein undergoes a conformational change but as we mentioned, that's just a fancy way of saying that it changes its shape. And probably one of the best examples of this is glucose. Notice here, our glucose comes in and binds to the carrier. And when it does that, the carrier changes shape so that now the top is closed and the bottom is open. And that glucose can enter into the cell. As soon as the glucose lets go, it goes back to its previous shape. And then a new glucose can bind and it changes shape and brings it in and back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. Notice the cell is never using any ATP. It is the energy of the glucose uh, that binds to it that changes the shape and allows it again to come in. Well, so yes, any channel blocker, you're absolutely correct. So if we go back to a channel, if you have some type of toxin and you take that toxin and that toxin blocks the opening of a channel, then it doesn't really matter whether the gate is opened or closed. Ions can't flow through it. Uh, that, uh, this one? Mm, maybe a little bit. Peter, it's a little bit more complex than that. All right, so those are our passive processes. Questions on that? All right, excellent. Let's go back to this here. Is that what you wanted to see? You wanted me, I was asked to go back? Yes. Okay, perfect. Excellent. So this is our passive processes, and let's cheat. Use a little bit more space than I wanted to, but I think I have enough room here to sneak in the other things that we need to talk about. All righty. So that is our passive transport. Let's now talk about active transport. Right? And when we talk about active membrane transport, 
Sort of in our digestive system, definitely there are valves that regulate the flow of things through it, absolutely. All right, active transport, as I mentioned, there's two keys to its definition. Uh, the first is that it is either going to directly or indirectly use ATP. And remember, for using ATP, typically we're doing it to move substances against their concentration gradients. All right, we comfortable with that as a definition? Now, notice active transport can occur two ways, directly or indirectly using ATP. So not surprisingly, there are two types of active transport. The first is primary active transport. And the second is secondary active transport. And what do you think the difference between primary active transport and secondary active transport is? One directly uses ATP and one indirectly uses ATP. Perfect, absolutely. Primary active transport directly uses ATP. These are what we often refer to as pumps and secondary active transporters indirectly use ATP. And these things are often referred to as co-transporters. All right, indirectly, excellent. Let's talk first about our primary active transporters. As I mentioned, these are our pumps. They directly use ATP to move ions or substances. We already talked about the most common one you would find in the body. And what was the most common one? There it is, that sodium potassium pump. Exactly, so let's put a little pump here. Actually, let's make it solid. The most common one is indeed that sodium potassium ATPase. Or sodium potassium pump. And remind me again, it is going to directly use ATP. So we're going to get a little ATP that is going to bind to it. Oh, no, hold on. I want that to be bigger. Give me that. And then here I can make it smaller. It's going to use that ATP that is going to bind directly to the molecule. And when it directly binds to the molecule, remind me again what it does. Chain ions from out in it. Uh, takes ions, uh, positive and negative ions, out of the cells. Nope. Close, but let's be more specific. What ions specifically does oh, the sodium, sodium potassium ATPase move? Sodium goes inside and potassium goes out. Is that, do we, need, do we really need to use ATP to get sodium to come into the cell? The inside of the cell is negative. There's a lot of sodium on the outside. So sodium wants to come in. There you go. What we need to do, if we're gonna use ATP, we are gonna do that to get sodium to go out of the cell. And remind me again, how many sodium do we kick out with one ATP? Three. Three, excellent. So three sodium are kicked out of the cell. And how many, and which way does potassium move? Out. Potassium moves in. Remember, it's going against its concentration gradient. If we're using ATP, we have to do work. And how many potassium does it bring in? Two. Two. Two potassium, excellent, excellent. Now, as I mentioned, the sodium potassium ATPase is the most common of our pumps, but there are lots of pumps. In fact, if you remember, one of the things we talked about is how calcium makes cells do wonky things. So do you think we want a lot of calcium floating around inside of our cell so that the cells do wonky things all the time? No, doing wonky things all the time is not good for you. So absolutely. So we're going to have some calcium pumps. 
And those calcium pumps, uh, make that big, are going to use ATP. And if I'm using ATP, directly using ATP by this molecule, which way do you think we're gonna move calcium? Outside. Out, absolutely. So we're gonna use uh, ATP to kick calcium out. There you go. So those are two examples of some of our pumps our primary active transporters. Their job is to kick things like sodium, kick things like calcium out, bring potassium back in, get things to move the direction they don't want to move. All right, I think those are hopefully pretty straightforward. If that doesn't make sense, we're in trouble because the next one's far worse. So any questions on these primary active transporters? All right, let's then talk about secondary active transporters. Remember, as we mentioned, and let's make this a little bigger, with our secondary active transporters, they do not directly use ATP to move substances. And again, I keep saying ions because ions are the charged particles. Those are usually things that we're moving in and out, but it's okay to say substances as well because glucose, amino acids, other things work like this as well. Instead, they use the energy from another molecule. Again, this isn't a foreign concept to us, right? Back in ancient times, by the 19, uh, you know, 1840s, you would want to come out here to California to mine for gold. And maybe you weren't so successful as a miner, so maybe instead you were really good at baking, and so you wanted to bake. And of course, if you're going to bake, you need flour. And if you have flour, you need to be able to grind wheat into flour. Grind those grains. Now, is that the kind of thing where you would just want a big bowl and a big stone and you would want to do by yourself? If you're going to have a successful mill, where would you put that successful mill? Near a town? True, near a town, but you'd also put it by a river. Because what you would do is you would put a big, huge wheel out in that river. And as the water flowed by in the river, it would turn your wheel. And that turning of your wheel is what spun your grindstone and grind your wheat into flour. Notice you were able to use the energy of the water to do work. Or let's go back to the example of me standing at the top of the hill with that ball. And you're at the bottom of the hill. And I need to give you your grade on the first exam. What I could do is I could holler it to you, which would require a lot of energy on my part, or I could write it on a piece of paper and stick it on that ball and then let the ball go. And the ball goes, does the work of rolling down the hill and it brings you that message. So notice I'm letting the driving force of something else do work for me. When I do that with a secondary active transporter, most of the time, I'm gonna use a particular ion. If only there was an ion that we had whose both their chemical force and their electrical force was to go into the cell and there was a massive driving force where it really, really, really wanted to come into a cell. Do we have an ion like that? Sodium, absolutely. Sodium. Most secondary active transporters use sodium. So here's what happens. Let's go ahead and draw one of these. Here is one of these co-transporters. This co-transporter says, all right, sodium, you really, really, really wanted to come into the cell? You can come into the cell. Come on into the cell. 
Happy to have you. But while you're turning this wheel to come in, I need you to do me a favor. I need you to use your energy to come inside to bring something else inside as well. Maybe you can bring a glucose in with you, or maybe you can bring an amino acid in with you, or something along those lines. I need to bring that in with you as well. Use your force to do that. All right. Notice you can see why it is a co-transporter. Because in this case, one molecule brings in a second. Or let's say it this way. One molecule moves a second molecule. All right. Now notice in this case, both the sodium and the other molecule move in the same direction. And because both sodium and the molecule move in the same direction, we call this a symporter. But it doesn't have to work that way. Instead, I can have my transporter here. And I say, sure, sodium, come on in. Happy to have you. And sodium is able to, we let the sodium come in and let me cheat and move this over so I have a little bit more room. So there it can go there, that can go there. My sodium can come here. And I say, all right, sodium, when you come in though, I need your energy to do work. I need you to kick something out for me like maybe a calcium, because we know those are pesky, or maybe I need you to kick out a hydrogen ion or some other type of waste material that you can get rid of for me. Notice in that case, the uh, sodium and the other molecule move in opposite directions. And when they move in opposite directions, we call that an antiporter. Oops. Let's be consistent. So notice a symporter moves the molecules in the same direction and an antiporter moves the ions or the, the molecules in opposite directions. Questions on that? You with me so far on this? All right, stunned silence means yes, not only do I understand this, but I understand it so well that you should make the test harder. So excellent, I love it when it's quiet because that tells me you've all mastered the material and I get to make the test so much harder. Awesome, excellent. But here's the issue. Notice I didn't write ATP anywhere on this picture for these parts. So how the heck is this? active transport. Well, let's use some really simple examples. And for this really simple example, we will say that just for argument's sake, there are 10 sodium on the outside of the cell, because we know there's more sodium on the outside of the cell. And uh, for argument's sake, we'll say that there are two sodium on the inside. All right. Now, we let one sodium come in so that I can bring in a glucose. How many sodiums do I have on the outside now? Not your question. 10 sodiums outside, one sodium goes in. How many sodiums do I have on the outside? 10 minus one is nine, excellent. So now there's nine. And how many sodiums do I have on the inside? Three, excellent. Three. Then I br use another sodium to bring in an amino acid. How many do I have on the outside? Eight. Eight. How many do I have on the inside? Four. Four. And now I use a sodium to kick out a calcium. Now I have seven on the outside. Now I have five on the inside. And then I use a sodium to kick out a hydrogen ion. And now I have six sodium on the outside and I have six sodium on the inside. 
And now does sodium want to come in anymore? If I have equal numbers of sodium inside and outside, is sodium going to want to come oh. in the cell anymore? No. Do and if it doesn't want to come in the cell anymore, can I get it to do work for me? No. So notice while I'm not directly using ATP, if I let this sodium stay inside the cell, these co-transporters are going to stop working. So as soon as the sodium comes in, what do I have to do to that sodium? Kick it out. Absolutely. As soon as that sodium comes in, I have to pump it out. And of course, if I'm going to pump it out, what is that going to require? ATP. Right. And that requires ATP. So I'm going to need some type of pump that is going to be able to use ATP to be able to kick that sodium back out when it comes in so that I can get it to keep doing work for me. So notice my co-transporters don't directly use ATP, but if I don't use ATP to kick that sodium out, or I can even use my sodium potassium pump to kick that sodium out, if I don't kick that sodium out, if I don't use ATP to get rid of that sodium, my co-transporters won't keep working. So that is why it is considered active transport, but it's secondary because it does not directly use it. All right. Questions on that? All right, I've done my drawings here. Let's look at the pretty pictures from your textbook. So again, as we mentioned, active transport is also a mediated or facilitated. We have to use proteins, but it's active, which means it uses ATP, typically moving molecules against the concentration gradient, not always, but most of the time. And like I said, the classic example is that sodium potassium ATPA, so that sodium potassium pump. They can be primary or secondary, whether they directly use ATP or indirectly. Secondary active transporters are co-transporters, often indirectly require ATP to keep them going. And like we talked about, they're two type symporters where both molecules move in the same direction. And antiporters where they move in opposite directions. And again, we did all those definitions on the other one. So really the reason I came here is I wanna show you the pretty pictures. I love this picture from your textbook because it really actually finally shows us the right way of how this sodium potassium ATPase works. Notice, without energy, this sodium potassium ATPase is only open on one side, to the inside of the cell. And while it's open to the inside of the cell, uh, sodium molecules, sodium ions, are able to bind to it. An ATP comes, and as we know, the way we release the energy from the ATP is phosphorylating that ATP or splitting that ATP. We rip off the phosphate. When we rip off the phosphate, we end up with ADP, and we release that energy. And when we release that energy, now we're using that energy to change the shape of the protein so that now it is open to the outside and our sodiums are expelled. While it's open to the outside, two potassiums can load into it. When the two potassiums load into it, that kicks off the phosphate and it goes back to its original shape, open on the inside and the potassium comes in. So notice one ATP kicks three sodium out and brings two potassium in. Here we see our secondary active transporters, those co-transporters. Again, notice sodium really, really, really wants to get into a cell. So we say, okay, sodium, come in, we're bringing a glucose with you. Or come in and bring an amino acid with you. And when both molecules move in the same direction, we call that a symporter. But we can also use sodium coming in to kick out a potassium, I mean a calcium or allow sodium to come in to kick out a hydrogen. 
when they move in opposite directions, we call them antipolars. And again, as soon as this sodium comes in, if we're gonna keep these co-transporters working, we have to kick that sodium back out, and to do that is gonna require ATP. That is why it is secondary, because it still needs ATP, but it uses it indirectly. All right, questions on that? Excellent, that is everything I have for you today. So that is our lecture, like I said, I knew we would get caught up, uh, so that is good. I know you guys have a nice long week off before we meet again, but make sure you use this time wisely. You only have two weekends to study for the first exam. So make sure you are studying hard for that, pay attention to that. Yes, study your brains off, absolutely. We're gonna come back and do our second big physiological concept on protein synthesis. I will tell you right now, um, again, well, let's talk about that in a second. I will tell you right now, being the sophisticated students that you are, when we talk about protein synthesis, protein synthesis involves two related processes. And when I give you two related processes, how many possible essay questions does that give you on the exam? Three. What are they? There you go. Describe process one. Describe process two, compare the two processes, right? So those are three big questions that you could have, right? How are they similar? How are they different? So again, those I guarantee those are the types of questions that are gonna be on the exam. Protein synthesis is really important. And we're gonna be doing our practice lab exam. Again, I do study guides for the lab stuff when it is appropriate. Uh, we'll do that for the tissues, we'll do that for the skin, we'll do that for the other systems, bones and bone features. But I don't do it for the lectures because you're responsible for everything we talk about in lectures. So if I wrote you a study guide, it would have to be everything we talked about in lecture, and I would be rewriting my lectures, and I'm not interested in doing that. What I found is if I give students a study guide for the lecture, all they do is study the study guide. They don't actually look at the lectures which means that I have to put everything that's on the lectures on the study guide and then I'm rewriting my lectures. I don't do that, All right? You are responsible for everything we talked about in this class, every homework assignment, everything that you've done. I didn't randomly pull these things out of a hat. These things are the things that are important and that's what you're responsible for. Yeah, you need to know the parts of the microscope. You have to have a basic concept of how it works, even though you're never gonna hold one in your hand. Guess what? You're never gonna hold a bone in your hand. You need to know those too. You need to understand those concepts of how we work. Um, yes, the depth that I give it to you in lecture is how I expect you to know it. Uh, if the book goes more in depth, then yes, you just need to know it to the level that I talked about it. If your book goes less in depth, then you need to talk about it to the level that I talked about it for, absolutely. However, you're never gonna get in trouble for going more in depth. If the book gives you more in depth than we did in class and you give me more in depth, you're not gonna lose points for that. Where you lose points is for not being specific enough. Yes, again, that's why I don't bother doing a study guide for this lab exam. You need to know all the regional terms. You need to know all the directional terms. You need to know all the parts of a cell. Now you need to know all the parts of the plasma membrane. Writing out that list is redundant. When we get to the bones and bone features and you're not responsible for all the bone features, that's when you'll get a study guide. When, when we are narrowing the information to more specific, uh, components, that's when you're responsible. That's when you'll, you'll have a study guide that'll tell you what that is. But for this first test, you need to know everything we've talked about. So, uh, so that makes it easy. Um, the lab and lecture exams are going to be where the quizzes are. So the same place you've gone for the daily quiz, the same place you've gone for the proctorio quiz, the chemistry quiz, they are going to be, again, because quizzes is the term that proctorio and canvas uses, they're in that quizzes tab. So you'll go to the quizzes tab and that is where you'll start them. Typically, I'm still tinkering with them, uh, but um, especially with us having an eight o'clock in the morning class, what'll happen is I will publish them probably um, Sunday night, but obviously they will be locked until Monday morning at eight. So you'll actually be able to see the introduction to it, how many questions on it or things along those lines. Uh, I will try to get the recorded lecture uploaded to uh, YouTube as quickly as I can. As always, I try to get that done as, as fast as I can uh, to get that done.
Um, the reason you have the lab and lecture exams on the same day is because what I found in the past, and again, I'm relating this to what we do in the classroom, but I imagine it would be the same thing here. I know there are some instructors who like to split up the lab and the lecture exams. Uh, and so what they will do is lecture for half the class and then the other half the class you'll take the exam. I've always found that to be an incredible waste of time. Because if I try to lecture to you before the exam, no one's paying any attention to that because they're preparing for the exam. If I try to lecture to you after you've taken an exam, nobody's paying any attention to that because you're all brain dead from taking the test. So lecturing on the same day as a test, in my, uh, in my opinion, is something that is not productive. All right. The other important thing to remember is that this is one class. We don't have a lab class and a lecture class, and you are responsible for all the information on all of the exams. So it's not like you're studying this information over here for lab and this under information over here for lecture. You're studying one big ball of information and lab and lecture exams are just different ways of studying that material. So it's all the same material. So all your tests are on the same day at the same time. And I'm not gonna lecture on the same day we have the lectures, I mean the exams. So on Monday the 14th, your sole responsibility on that day is to maximize your points on the lab and the lecture exams. Yes, it has to be done during the class time. Correct, this is a synchronous class. So if we were taking this class on the, if we were taking this class in on campus, you would have to take it during the class time. I know that's not a typical way to run an online class, but you gotta remember this is not a typical online class. Anatomy and physiology is not an online class. It should never be an online class. We're being forced to do it this way, but the same reason I have live lectures is because this should be synchronous. This should be together. You are expected to be responsible for this class during those times, and that is gonna be when the exams are available. So the exams will not be available anytime outside of when we are in class. All righty. Awesome. Any other questions? And again, uh, Wednesday's lecture will not take the whole time. So on Wednesday, also remember we're gonna do the practice lab exam. That'll give you a chance to see what a lab exam, a timed lab exam in an anatomy and physiology class is like. We'll give you that opportunity to be able to uh, prepare yourself. And hopefully it'll give you a chance to gauge how your studying is going. So that after doing that, you can see, all right, I've been studying this material the right way. Or maybe you'll say, oh, I haven't been studying this material the right way. And the good news is you will have five days to modify the way that you are studying for this class to help you to be successful when you do it for real. Also on Wednesday, if we have time, I will do an exam review. An exam review is not me standing up here telling you what I think is important. That's what I do, do every day in lecture. What I see review is, is the opportunity for you to ask questions of me about things you don't understand. And then we'll work together as a group to come up with those answers. And remember, if I have a question and answer review and you guys don't ask me questions, that's your way of telling me that you've mastered the information and you want me to make the test harder. All right. Yes, I agree. The first three chapters is a ton of information. Welcome to anatomy and physiology. It could be worse. If you take this during the summer, the first test is two weeks in and it is the first five chapters. In the summer, the first two tests are combined into one. So you're actually getting off easy. All right. Yes, I agree. That is why no one, look, I spent, I spent the, the week before summer school telling students they shouldn't take summer school. I spent everyone who emailed me about it, it the people in the class, and some of them are here, they can tell you. I, I, am, I was totally honest with everybody. I am fully believe that no one should take this class during the summer, even when it's on campus. Online, it was insane. And as expected, it was insane. Yeah, exactly. And that's why I had two A's which is nuts. You guys, I promise, will have more than two A's in this class. All right. Any other questions? Again, we have a week off, so I'm happy to answer any more of these that you guys have. So I don't need to share the screen anymore because it's just black. 
you look at my big head. All right, and more importantly, I can see all of you. All right, excellent. Any other questions? Uh, chapter two questions. Oh, what question about chapter two? Oh, in chapter two with chemistry. Oh, okay, so excellent. Perfect example of what we were talking about before. In chapter two, there is a ton of information, right? But a lot of it, it remembers we talked about is the stuff you needed to know coming into it, right? For chapter two, what you are responsible for on the exam is what we talked about in class, and that is the, mic the macromolecules. So all the stuff about proteins and carbohydrates and nucleic acids and whatever the other one is, I can't remember the first three that I said, um, those macromolecules, those are things we talk about. All the stuff before that, that's the stuff you were supposed to know going into it. It was a good review if you needed it for the chemistry quiz. But I'm not going to be asking you those things on the exam. I'm not going to ask you to tell the difference between an acid and base as an essay question on the exam, because those are things you should have known coming in here. I'm not going to ask you what the difference between a covalent bond and a polar bond is, because that's not in here. Now, knowing that hydrogen bonds are weak because of how that affects the morphology of the structural levels of our protein, so it makes them sensitive to temperature and pH, is that important? Talking about how hydrogen bonds being weak help us to separate the two strands of DNA when we're replicating the DNA, is that concept important there? Sure, so if there's things like that that we've used, then that's information you need to know. But again, the, 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 all of that previous stuff, only, you're only responsible for the chemistry stuff that we talked about in class. Uh, it usually takes me about a week to grade the exam. So when we take it on Monday, the uh, 14th, my goal will be to get it back to you on the 21st. Uh, again, the, the, lab, the lab exams, the lecture exams, none of that. The only thing that grades automatically are the multiple choice. I have to go through the fill in the blanks. I have to go through the essays. I have to go through every single one of the lecture exam, the, the lab exams, and I do all the grading. So uh, there's two good things about, well, the one, there's one good thing about that. It's standard. I try to be very standard, very fair in the way that I grade so that everybody gets graded equally. The bad part of it is I have to do it all. And I still have to lecture to you. And I still have my 431 class to worry about and their grades to, and their tests to make and all the stuff that goes along with that. So uh, it takes about a week. If I get it done early, you will get it back early. But often I need a weekend to get it done. And so that's the problem. I've got Friday, Saturday, and Sunday off. So those are usually my big grading days. So when we have a Monday exam, there's no way you're getting it back on Wednesday. There's just too much information for me to get graded and get it back. So that means you'll get them back on the following Monday. If I get them graded before then, I will post the grades. But you won't be able to see the exams until Monday the 16th. And typically what I do is I release the exams for one day so that you can see uh, what you wrote and you can see your scores for 24 hours and then the next day uh, it gets closed down again. So again, I want exams to be learning processes, but these are obviously questions that get used again and again, so I wanna limit their availability. I unfortunately have to limit their availability. All right. Great questions, any others? All right, I saw the question too. Did I miss any others? Anybody else any questions I've missed or new ones? Professor? Yes. Is the exam at a hundred point, like the lab and the lecture? So lecture exams are always gonna be out of a hundred points. Um, so they're always gonna be out of a hundred points that they're standard across all of them. Again, because all the lecture exams are equal. That's one of the reasons why we can use the final to replace one of them is because they're gonna all be worth hundred points. The lab exams aren't equal because there's different amounts of anatomy in them. This section has a decent amount of anatomy, right? Uh, the next section may have less. Uh, when we get to the bones and bone features of the muscles, there's a lot in those. So the lab exams typically vary between someone like 85 questions and probably 60, 60 to 85 between those range. So some have a little bit more, some have a little bit less, but they're all worth less than the lecture exams. And for those, However many questions on it, it's one point per question. So if it's got 75 questions, it's gonna be worth 75 points. And remember, I will curve it 
Uh, it's not a traditional curve because Proctorio doesn't really allow that to do to us to do it that way, where I can't do a traditional curve, but I will. Uh, there are uh, what Proctorio calls fudge points. So uh, once I figure out what the curve is, then I usually will put in like two or three fudge points depending on what's necessary. Again, it's relatively new. I've done it during summer and I've done it during the end of last year. So I think I've done everything from two points added to a sc the scores to I think the most was like seven and a half or something like that. It really depends on, on really how well you guys do as a whole. Uh, I may have already answered this. Uh, uh, I think I did, but I have, again, I have no problem repeating myself. Again, it varies from question from test to test, but on average, I would say there's probably going to be about 30 multiple choice questions on the lecture exam, uh, usually somewhere between two and uh, eight, now two and six, maybe fill in the blank. Those are usually where you're going to have to write out words like, you know, hypochondriac or or something along those, the alphabet soup words, identification, things along those lines. And then usually somewhere around eight, you know, seven to nine, six to eight, somewhere around that, essay questions. And again, this is one of those things as a sophisticated student where you have to be sophisticated. You may have eight essay questions, but they're gonna be worth different amounts. One essay question may be worth three points. If, it's, if you have an essay question worth three points, so should you write four paragraphs in answering that particular essay question? No, probably not. But if you have an essay question worth 10 points, do you think you're gonna get full credit if you just write one sentence? No. No, it'd have to be one hell of a sentence, right? To be able to do that, right? And probably a very long run on sentence as well. Right. Be a sophisticated student. Look at how many points something is worth, and that should give you an idea of just how in-depth, how much information, how much detail. Something that's worth 10 points has more content in it than something worth four points. Right? So make sure you're writing more. Well, the, what, what I usually say on the first exam is on the first exam, I usually go through one and a half red pens of writing and or explain or describe over and over again on these exams. What people lose points for primarily is two things. They're not descriptive enough. They don't explain enough, right? Be descriptive, be specific, give me details. That's how you show me you've mastered the material. And the second way that people lose points is by not reading the questions carefully. You have to read the question carefully to answer them correctly. I may have an exam question where I ask you to describe and give me an example of, and let's talk about something we talked about today, primary active transporter. And someone may do an amazing job of talking about this particular protein that allows sodium to rush into the cell because sodium really wants to go into the cell because it has a strong chemical gradient and a strong electrical gradient, really driving it into the cell. And we're able to use that kinetic energy of sodium coming in to do work for us, to either pump other things out or bring other substances in. Like a great example would be a code transporter that would bring sodium in and would bring a glucose in with it. And because they're both moving in the same direction, we would call that a symporter. And that is a great amount of information. And every single part of that is, success, is correct. And you've given me great knowledge and shown me that you had great knowledge. But what's the problem? They explain secondary, not but, primary. Exactly. I asked for a primary active transporter. You answered the harder question. It's harder to explain secondary active transporter than primary. You answered a harder question. You gave me massive knowledge, tremendous knowledge, did a great job of showing me that, that information. But did you answer the question? No. And if you don't answer the question, even though you showed knowledge, even though you showed an understanding, if you don't answer the question, I can't give you credit. So make sure you read the questions carefully. People often lose points, not because they don't know the information, but because they don't read the questions carefully. Read the questions carefully so you can answer them correctly. Same thing is especially true on the lab exams. As we talked about on the lab exams, I can have an arrow pointing at the nucleus of a cell and you're gonna get all excited because you're gonna see that there's 75 lab exam questions and you're gonna feel the pressure of time. Oh my God, I gotta answer all these. Oh, that's easy, I can see it pointing to the nucleus. But as we talked about, you gotta read the question because maybe I'm asking the organelle, but maybe I'm asking the structure, to which case you'd say nuclear envelope. 
or maybe I'm saying identify the macromolecule that this is made up of, and you'd say phospholipid, or maybe I'm asking describe the function of this organelle, right? You have to make sure that you are reading the question carefully so you can answer it correctly. Um, are you going to put on the last slide on, on Canvas? Like the one you was talking about, the second and the primary? Oh, the one I drew? Yeah. Uh, I think I saved it, but let's go ahead and save it again to make sure. Yeah, I'll post, I'll post those, both those pictures. So this one and the mitosis pictures, I will go ahead and post those. So I went ahead and saved it a second time so that, thank you for reminding me that. I think I did that before, but uh, it's good to remember because if I didn't, uh, then there's no way for me to go back and get that. All righty. Awesome questions. Any others? All right. Well, you've got a long weekend, so you have plenty of time to think of them. No, I've been here the whole time. I haven't had a chance to check it yet, but I will. I promise. Wait, hold on. Is it Spockle or Sporkle? I thought there was an R in there. Is it with an R or without an R? Okay, perfect, excellent. All right, no, I have not checked that out, but I will check it out. And like I said, if it looks good, I will add it to the uh, study tools on our uh, on our uh, on our Canvas site. Excellent. So yes, thank you for the heads up on that. I do appreciate it. All right. Anything else? Excellent. All right, you guys have a good, safe, enjoyable week off. But it's not really a week off, just means that you now have a week of undirected studying. Work hard, although it's not completely undirected. You have one, two, three activities that are gonna keep, keep you pretty busy. Again, I will emphasize those physio X's are not hard, but they are time consuming. They take a bit of time because they really want you to have the lab experience. Uh, it's better, the, the version two versions ago was even worse. They truly wanted you to have the full lab experience. So after you were done using a beaker, for instance, you had to wash the beaker and put it on the drying rack and go grab a new one. So, I mean, it was incredibly tedious. And even though they've streamlined the process, it still is a bit tedious. I'll be honest, it's a bit tedious, but I think it's a good learning experience and it takes time. It's not hard, but it takes time. So make sure you give yourself enough time. If you wait till Tuesday night, to complete that, you're not getting any sleep. You've got a whole week off, spread it out. Do one a day between now and then. It'll help you to keep looking at and studying the material and you'll be fine from there. Remember, there's five different activities on that, so you're gonna end up with five lab reports. All right, excellent. Take care, you guys. Have a good week off. Remember, no, uh, even though it shows it in here, because again, I, I just set up the pattern so that it repeated every Monday and Wednesday. We do not have lecture on Monday. There's no lecture on Monday. Sleep in study hard, uh, be safe, and I will see you in a week. Take care, guys.